So good morning, everyone. Good morning and a warm welcome on behalf of the Willem and Elsa Reus Foundation to this symposium. My name is Stefan Jorda. I'm the managing director of the foundation. And before we start talking about science, it's a pleasure to say a few words about our foundation. Our founder, Willem Heinrich Reus, he was born 1900. He studied physics, mathematics, and physical chemistry, and he completed his PhD in physics at the age of 23 at the University of Frankfurt, which was not uncommon at the time to complete a PhD at such a young age. His advisor was Walter Gerlach, who today, whose name can be found nowadays in every textbook due to the famous uh, Stein-Gerlach experiment. So this is where the exciting years where quantum mechanics was developed, but Wilhelm Heinrich Reus decided to leave academia, and he entered a company which his grandfather has founded in 1856. Herr Reus' company it still exists today, and it's one of the top 10 family-owned companies in Germany. He spent his whole professional career as manager and entrepreneur in this company, and, but he remained always interested in physics. As shareholder of the company, he and his wife Else were quite rich, but they had no kids, and therefore in the 1960s they decided to establish the foundation. After Willem and Else passed away in the 1980s, all their company shares were transferred into the property of the foundation, and today it's a dividend of these shares which constitutes our regular income, the money which we use to sponsor an event like this one here. So coming to our activities, the purpose today is the support of research and education in science with an emphasis on physics. We pursue this goal, for example, by funding school activities, teacher training courses, or by organizing scientific communication, or by cooperating with other institutions, especially the German Physical Society. To give just a few examples in the field of education, we fund exemplary projects um, to improve physics teaching at school, this activity comprises a wide range of topics from astronomy to climate change or renewable energy. And a substantial part of our activities is related to scientific communication, starting with our oldest activity, the Vihe Hareo seminars about cutting edge research in, in physics and related fields. They are often compared to Gordon conferences um, with the important difference that the organizers of Hareo seminar don't have to care about funding. These seminars in general take place at the Physik Centrum Bad Honnef in Bonn. I'm sure many of you have, the, have been there before. A more recent activity I want to mention are the binational Hereo seminars, whose idea is to initiate new or foster existing collaborations between research groups in Germany on one side and a partner country on the other side. So scientists from Germany and the partner country can submit such a proposal, and the seminars can take place either in Germany or the partner country. Whereas the first binational seminars we organized were with, all, with European partners, especially Poland, Great Britain, and France. Um, we have now scheduled seminars with Argentina, Brazil, the US, or Taiwan, just to mention a few examples. And this symposium today, of course, fits perfectly into these activities. Coming to the end, I'd like to thank the organizers, Oliver Benson and Thomas Elsass, and of course the team of the Falling Walls to make this symposium possible, and I hope that you will have a great day and benefit as much as possible. Many thanks. I'd like to ask the first speaker to come forward, Libor Schmeckhal. So he's a research team leader at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz and associate researcher at Czech Academy of Science, a physicist, as I said, and uh, his background is theoretical experimental physics and he works in topological and magnetic quantum matter. So I want to keep this short, not to take away time from your eight minutes. We're happy that you're here and the stage is yours. Thanks a lot for the introduction and also thanks a lot to the organizers for making this possible. This is fantastic. I actually have uh, experience with the Herao seminars and there will be one next year about the topic of outer magnetism. So I will talk uh, about a very simple message. And the simple message is that usually in physics textbooks we are learned about uh, two different classes of magnets. Ferromagnets and antiferromagnets. And today I will try to pitch to you that actually it turns out that there is a third one, outer magnetism. So this is a work which we were working together with uh, quite a few people, especially Professor Tomasz Jungwirth and Jairo Sinova in Prague and Mainz for almost a decade by now. And eventually it grew into a huge collaboration. So I would like to acknowledge also many of our experimental colleagues and younger colleagues as well. So in this picture, you see uh, what is example of such a outer magnet, and you see that there is actually extra ordering of this anisotropic spatial 
spin density. And this has very interesting consequences for, for instance, dissipation as electronics, as I will try to explain you today. So, these are the two conventional classes. Ferromagnets are characteristic by magnetization, and since the end of the 19th century, thanks to Curie, we know that they can be thought of as pseudovectors. They have strong signals, however, they are limited to gigahertz frequency. So that's why, for instance, magnetic hard drives can go only as fast as gigahertz. On the other hand, uh, antiferromagnets were discovered 90 years ago by Nell, and they have compensated magnetic order. So they do not have magnetization, and that's fantastic because we can switch them three orders of magnitude faster. However, at the same time, it's an obstacle because they are uh, very difficult to read. The signals, electronic signals, are very weak in them. So 10 years ago, together with Tomáš and Jairo, we were asking a question whether we can have something more general. So basically, if we can do electronics with uh, more general systems, which would combine the benefits of both of these type of magnets. And uh, coming from this motivation and also motivation of searching for low dissipation currents in this more general current, more general magnets, we uh, came actually to the question or to the analogy that uh, if you look into the orbitals, they can be ordered by S, P, D uh, wave orbital character. However, for magnets, we usually use just the picture of the arrows, which are basically these isotropic S waves. So the question was whether we can have something more unconventional, like this anisotropic D wave, where the sign of the spin is changing when we go around. And uh, the unexpected uh, uh, direction came from spintronics, where we found out that when we actually decorate this antiparallel, antiferromagnetic like ordering with additional extra non magnetic atoms, we end up with something that actually behaves exactly like this. And I will try to explain you now why is it uh, so interesting and why actually such a type of uh, magnetic matter is different from the two conventional ones. So, for understanding that, we need to revisit the way how we think about magnets in two basic ways. So in the first way is that it's important to consider also the spatial anisotropy of the magnetization density. While in many magnets, the uh, spin density is isotropic, in these more unconventional magnets, it's strongly anisotropic, and that means that on top of the local magnetization vector, you need to consider the anisotropy, which can be understood by this picture of the diamond. The second important aspect is that usually in magnetism, we are thinking about symmetries acting simultaneously on the atoms and on the spins. So for instance, in this example, you have seen that when I rotate by 90 degrees, I need to rotate both degrees of freedom. So I end up with operation, which is not a symmetry of this crystal. However, I can formulate something more general. I can formulate pairs of operations and then I can rotate by 90 degrees in the crystallographic space, combine it with 180 degrees in the spin space. And such a symmetry operations are more general, and they now allowed me to find all possible magnets. So we try to do this classification, and we were able to reconstruct the two conventional phases, magnetic phases. I will not go into the details of the magnetic symmetries, but you can see that this mathematics is very different for them. Basically, in ferromagnets, you have one spin sublattice. In antiferromagnets, you have two spin sublattices related by translation, for instance. And finally, there exists yet third possibility where the single spin sublattice is breaking the symmetry of the crystal because you see that this has a lower symmetry than the square. And then, when we rotate such a sublattice and we change its spin, it remains a symmetry. So we have now again this 90 degree rotation in the crystal space combined with 180 degree rotation in spin space. And it turns out that these are equally likely possibilities mathematically, which are separated distinctly by these walls. So now we have basically a situation like in this Escher picture where we have uh, these two different sublattices running in different directions. And it turns out that such a magnetic order which can be simplified to this picture, has very interesting consequences. So let's look into the consequences. And the first important consequence is that we can split spin states in these materials. So 
commonly, electrons in materials are coming in pairs, which spin up and spin down. Now, the two ways how we know from textbooks how to split them is either by ferromagnetic field or by relativistic effects in non-central symmetric heavy materials. When we look into the electronic structure of alter magnets, it turns out that we can split the spin states by a third type. And th this third type is characteristic by not requiring any magnetization and also no non-centrosymmetricity or relativistic effects. And this has important consequences because the splitting can be super strong. So we were actually even able to measure experimentally in collaboration with our colleagues from Switzerland the splitting and you see that the prediction and the experiment are beautifully corresponding. And you see that there is indeed a huge scale which corresponds to hundreds of mill electron volts. Now, with such a splitting, we can actually do low dissipation electronics. So we can have whole currents which are not losing energy. And we can also have spin polarized currents, which can be used in magnetic memories. So all of these theoretical predictions were now by several groups, including ours, uh, confirmed. And this brings me actually uh, to the last slide, whether there are more materials, because very often, great materials are very rare. And it turns out that actually there is more than 200 materials. So here is a uh, table and you see that there can be really strong spin splitting. So with this, uh, let me show you uh, just the all possible different directions, which we know by now can be influenced by this uh, new type of magnets. And uh, there are already existing papers from hundreds of groups all around the world. And uh, let me invite you to maybe brainstorm in the question session for what everything it can be useful. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Liba, for this great uh, insight. I think we have time now for one or two questions. So uh, please wave your hand. There's one, yeah. The microphone is coming. Thank you. May I ask what happens if you have higher order D wave orbitals uh, and different lattices? Are there a plethora of materials with those characteristics? That's a very good question. So there exist actually also G wave and I wave. And I was a little bit cheating because the material which I was showing you, it's not D wave, but it's G wave. And it can be also super interesting. It has many consequences. Thank you. So one more quick question, if you have. If not, fine too. As mentioned, we can continue the discussion later. It's a pitch, so just a motivation for discussion and questions later. Thank you again, and uh, Thank you. thanks. Huh? Keshav is um, working at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, uh, working with ultra-fast and non-linear processes, and uh, his recent work involves imaging dark excitons in two-dimensional semiconductors and defects in perovskite uh, photonic materials, and we are looking forward to your presentation. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. So the mic is on, yes? Thank you. So my name is Keshav Dani, and I come from the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. I'm happy to tell you more about this very unique university down the line. So for today, let me start my story about 100 years ago. So about 100 years ago, we had understood how semiconductors worked. Uh, there's a valence band that's completely filled, and then there's a gap in which no states are expected to exist, at least in an ideal semiconductor. And then there's an empty conduction band. And if you shine light on a semiconductor, you create holes in the valence band and you create electrons in the conduction band that then conduct electricity and you get photoconductivity. So the mystery was that people had discovered there was a state in this forbidden region of the band gap. It turned out that when you shine light of a certain wavelength of frequency in this band gap region, you could actually absorb the light and you created now a neutral state. You didn't get any photocurrent out of this state. So uh, pioneering physicists at the time, Frankel and Bonnier, explained that what you got was an exciton. So essentially, the electron that you would create in the conduction band that's negatively charged <coughs> is attracted to the hole that you create in the valence band. And these two oppositely charged particles attract each other 
forming a bound particle called an exciton. So it's clear because they're bound, the energy of the exciton is lower than the electron in the hole, so it lies in the forbidden region. And obviously it's neutral because it's an electron and a hole bound together. So this was the exciton that they discovered in the decades since excitons have played a vital role in understanding the optical properties of materials as we discussed over dinner last night, as well as uh, technologies from LEDs to photovoltaics. And in the future, one expects them to play a critical role as a platform in <clears throat> quantum technologies. However, we have known all these years that we can only really directly access a small fraction of the excitons that exist. There's a class of excitons called the momentum forbidden dark excitons or indirect excitons for those who've been working in the community for a while that remain largely invisible to light. So let me explain why that happens. Yeah? So, so far I showed you this diagram. In this diagram, I just had a valence band, a conduction band. I drew this at what one would call a zero momentum. In reality, your electrons in the material have a momentum, and when you plot the momentum and the energy together, you get these dispersion curves that we just saw in the previous talk as well. And the bright excitons that we talked about are when the holes and the electrons sit at exactly the same momentum. And because they have the same momentum, the light that creates them doesn't need to carry any extra momentum. On the other hand, you can have an electron sitting in a different valley, a different momentum valley from the hole, and then there's a finite momentum between the two of them. Light doesn't have enough momentum to create or interact with such an exciton, and that's why these excitons are momentum forbidden dark excitons, uh, invisible to light. Though they are invisible to light, they obviously play a very important role because they interact with the bright excitons and uh, they impact our optoelectronic devices and functionality, etc., in good ways and bad. For example, the very property that makes them very hard to access, the invisibility to light, can also give them special protection. So if you were to create some sort of quantum phenomena or quantum state with these dark excitons, you could then potentially protect them from any decoherence or bad interaction with light. So how does one actually directly image or uh, probe these dark excitons? So this has been an open question for nearly a century. And then a few recent advances that allowed us to propel off of this and and break the wall to imaging dark excitons. So there's the discovery of two-dimensional semiconductors by Tony Hines in Columbia, the development of momentum microscopy right here in Germany with Sean Henze, and some theoretical work in Rome by Stefanucci's group that allowed us to build a fantastic, uh, powerful experiment. We worked on it for almost a decade, and OIST was a unique place that allowed us to do this. Uh, it's something fancy, I'm happy to talk about it later. And with that, we were able to image dark excitons. So here's a, a spectrum of the band structure that I told you about earlier. Here's momentum, energy. You see the momentum and energy states. And this is where you would create holes and this is where you would create electrons. And if you were dark excitons, you would create them here. So shining light on this and imaging in momentum space within a, f within a fraction of a thousandth of a billionth of a second, you get this. For the first time, you directly see the bright excitons that are created sitting in the band gap region, as well as the dark excitons, exactly as Wanier and Frankel predicted 100 years ago. Uh, not just, well, so uh, the instrumentation is pretty fancy. I didn't get a chance to really show off its capabilities, but let's make a movie. When I was a young kid, I remember my father telling me about semiconductors. And you imagine in your head that there's a valence band and a conduction band, and light comes in, and electrons go up, and they move around. Well, now you can just make a movie of this. So I'm going to show you a movie. This is momentum space, two-dimensional momentum space, x-axis, y-axis, and energy. This is the top of the valence band. It's the three-dimensional or two-dimensional band structure. I'm going to shine light and play a movie, and light's going to come in at zero picoseconds. And then you see the creation of excitons that then scatter around in different parts of momentum space. 
it, it took us a decade to get this movie. The actual movie, <laughs> the actual movie, we took it only over 20 minutes. But uh, <laughs> so, not only can you see electro excitons in momentum space, but you can now do things to see them in real space as well. So I told you an exciton was an electron running around a hole. What we're going to do, well, you image it in momentum space, and you take a Fourier transform to then take an actual picture of what the electronic distribution looks like around the hole. So in this picture, the hole sits at the center, and this is an actual image of the electron inside the exciton uh, on the scale of two billionth of a meter and taken in a thousandth of a millionth of a second. Thousandth of a billionth of a second, okay. Uh, let me end with one really cute phenomena that you see, and I think I have exactly enough time to talk about it. So, an exciton is an electron and a hole bound together. An electron sits in the conduction band. Electrons in the conduction band have a positive mass, which is given by this upward pointing parabola in its energy momentum curve. Holes sit in the valence band and holes have a negative mass because the parabola points downwards. A theoretical prediction says from decades ago that if the electron and hole are bound together in an exciton and you forcibly pull apart the electron, from its partner, it responds not with its own mass, but the mass of the partner that you separated it from. So nature writes poetry, and we physicists, physicists build the instrumentation to read that poetry. So there's the negative mass of an electron pulled out from the exciton. And so the future is to be able to do quantum technologies with this now that you can directly access dark excitons. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very impressive uh, contribution. So again, we have time for uh, one or two questions or something that comes to your mind. Uh, here, Stefan. Uh, sorry, I didn't get one point. You, you mentioned that the excitons normally are called dark because there's missing momentum. So in your optical experiment, where does this missing momentum come from? It would usually come from a phonon. So in the movie ah, okay. that you saw... You need another excitation exactly. which accounts well, for the... That would yeah. be thermally there, exactly. That okay. would be thermally in your system. Those measurements were at 100 Kelvin. There's a phonon bath. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There's another question. Is this momentum actually an angular momentum here? Sorry, sorry. Uh, in, in, in a bound system, is it actually a very high angular momentum or is it a real linear momentum? This, what I measure, is a linear momentum. I imagine I could measure the angular momentum as well. I'd have to think about it a little bit. But the electron, I didn't explain the system, but you photo emit the electron. And when you pull the electron out, you measure its, uh, the angle at which it's photo emitted, which tells you the, the lateral momentum in the material. I imagine I'd have to think a little bit whether one can actually access some sort of angular momentum. But, but if it's a bound state, then it must be orbiting. Of course it does, of course. So, you know, I mean, the, the linear momentum and angular momentum can be expressed in terms of each other. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. You. Research, uh, director, research director at the Vision Institute of CNS in Paris. And uh, she played a key role in the optogenetics revolution. And uh, so, this allows uh, or gives the possibility uh, to use light to mimic specific uh, properties and uh, act, uh, patterns in brain activity. And uh, so uh, I'm not sure whether you're talking about this, but anyway, we're looking very, uh, very much forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And thanks to the organizer to give me the honor of being in this very exceptional event. Uh, so, uh, my lab is in Paris, and we are a mixture of physicists and neuroscientists, and the interest of the lab is to develop and use uh, new optical methods for what we call today all optical manipulation of neuronal circuits. So, let me explain a little bit what the field is. So, indeed, today we can use... Uh, um, what we call genetically encoded calcium and voltage indicators. So these are light sensitive proteins that become brighter or dimmer when there is an electrical signal propagating through, <coughs> through a, a neuronal circuits. And so we can really uh, image or what we say, read out how those signals propagate in a circuit. But we can also do more today with light 
which is also to manipulate those, the, the, those signals and the way they propagate. And this is thanks to the use of optogenetics actuator. So these are light gated pump or channel that can be expressed on neuronal membrane so that it is possible to control the current that flow through neural membranes so that we can precisely with light either evoke an action potential or inhibit the propagation of those signals. So those proteins, uh, both actuator and uh, reporter, are explicit, we say, in a genetic way, meaning that we can use engineered viruses so that in their genetic code they contain uh, the gene coding of those photosensitive proteins plus a promoter so then when the virus is injected in the brain, all neurons are going to be infected, but only the one able to recognize the promoter are going to become light sensitive. And so you can perceive the importance of this by looking at those two examples. So can you send the movie, please? So the first one is the, in the reading side. So here, cell in the visual cortex of a mouse have been selectively uh, make a light sensitive and so you can see with the imaging we can precisely see how those neurons activate while projecting visual stimulation to the mouse. And in the second movie you will see that we can also express in a genetic way actuator in this specific case, this has been expressed in the motor cortex. So you will see at a certain point that light bring into the mouse brain with an optical fiber will activate those neurons, so giving rise to all the, the process that let the, the mice moving in this case towards the left. So when we combine those two properties, we are able so, to see what happens in a microcircuits, but also to intervene, to manipulate the recorded activity. So, um, the uh, big, uh, uh, one of the main uh, uh, use of optogenetic this now, till now, has been to be able, using this approach with an optical fiber, to correlate what a certain cell type is doing. And so it has been possible for the first time to identify, for example, the neurons involved in memory, in fear, anxiety, addiction, depression, and so on. So this approach is, is really powerful, but also has a limitation in the way as it is described now. And this is that when you shine line in this way, eventually all the neurons making light sensitive are going to be synchronously activated or inhibited. Why today the next phase of optogenetics will be somehow to not only individuate which neuron doing what, but also how a neuronal circuits work. And so this requires to answer a series of questions, for example, how this, the, the elements in a circuits are connected among them, and then is there, uh, uh, can we find neuronal or, or specific cell assembly that have a major role in controlling the entire circuits? And still, how important is a specific special pa te temporal pattern to control a certain function? And so for this, uh, 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 we, we need to tra transition from this whole region of optogenetics to a more sophisticated combination of approaches where we can ideally manipulate single of multiple cer cells independently in space and time. <laughs> So how can we get the precision for circuits optogenetics? This is what my lab has worked in the past year, was to combine different light shaping approach so to reach this precision. And precisely we developed a computer generated holography and generally phase contrast method to control how the light is focalized on the sample plane. So these are two approaches using the principle of holography or phase contrast method that thanks to the use of special light modulator enable, as you can see, to generate an illumination pattern that very well, very well reproduce the target that you have chosen on the base of the fluorescence. So this can be in a number of cells that we can selectively activate or even just a cell, a cell or a dendrite. And then to be also very precise along the axial direction, those two approaches being combined with temporal focusing. This is an approach where thanks to a dispersive grading it's possible to make the illumination, the laser paths broader out of the focal plane so you can precisely only concentrate absorption at the plane of interest. So we combine this approach together, and thanks to that, we have been among the first to demonstrate that indeed it is possible to, opto to use optogenetics to control the activity of single of multiple targets in a very precise way, in vitro first and in vivo afterwards. Uh, you, you can see in this movie, these are data from my lab in vivo. Can you send the movie, please? So where in red, you see the multiple neurons that you can find in the visual cortex. And then at the first, we shine three holographic spots on three of these neurons. The three neurons are responding. But we can be even more precise, just shine the light on one of the three neurons, and only that one is responding. So we are really on the way to play with light to switch on and off activity in a specific microcircuit. So after those first. Uh, pioneering microscope, then we are keeping now of, of 
taking the approach or making the approach more and more sophisticated. So the first uh, point was, can we control even larger neurons? So can we generate temporal focus three-dimensional light pattern? And uh, can you send the movie, please? So now this is indeed possible. So we can uh, control multiple neurons also in 3D. And then, uh, as you will see in this, in this uh, second movie there, uh, it is also possible to go very quickly. So the question was, can we generate, and this is the case today, we can generate sequential light pattern with microsecond temporal resolution. So we are really on the way to read and write in, in real time, so to modify the activity that we see. And then we also took a lot of time to find, to, uh, to find a way to make those approaches compatible with fiber bundles so that we can also read and write in neuronal circuits that require animal uh, freeling of movement. The application, there have been many. Uh, here, the, I, I just select a few of them. So we took advantage of the precision of uh, single cell targeting to, for example, prove for the first time in the collaboration with Rosa Cossart that indeed in developing brain, it is possible to find some hub cells whose role is more important than all the others. So the perturbation of the activity of just one of these cells is able to control the synchronicity of the entire circuits. We could take advantage of three-dimensional lay shape to monitor how signal generated, for example, in the retina, in the bipolar layer, propagate up to the ganglion cell layer. And uh, we also could use the precision of holography to perform for the first time high throughput connectivity mapping in vivo. And then there are other labs also that has integrated this approach and the most spectacular results has been to be able for the first time to probe the threshold for perception. So how many neurons we need to manipulate to give the visual perception or factory perception or to control the orientation navigation in mice. So the general conclusion is that indeed with this approach we are on the way to manipulate neuronal circuits in a, with a very high special temporal precision, holding the potential to really unlock new frontiers in circuit neuroscience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for these yep. uh, uh, great presentations. So we have time for some questions. Thomas. Thanks for this nice talk, Valentina. So could you um, explain a little bit the parameters of the light you are using? I mean, what are typical optical powers and what is the time structure of your, of your pulses, in a sense? So do we, <coughs> all this approach to get single cell resolution, we need to, to use two photon excitation. So these are parts of the laser, so 100 femtosecond laser. Uh, depending on the option or the indicator, the typical wavelength using are between 920 and 1,030 nanometer. So this 1,030 nanometer is, is, is the, the wavelength used because it's where there are now these very powerful, powerful lasers. So uh, because especially if you want to target multiple cells in, in a parallel approach, light is going to be divided by the target. And so those lasers now can deliver 50 watt and more. And so it's really possible to, to, to control multiple targets at the same time. The temporal precision, you said, so temporal precision really depends on the light sensitivity, so uh, more or less we tested different options. Uh, I would say that with two to five milliseconds it's possible to evoke a spike, and uh, this is also very precise, so the, the standard deviation of the spike in time can be of the, the order of the sub milliseconds, so we can really very precisely predict when the spiking is happening. Thank you. How how deep in the brain? Thank you, Emilia. It was ex excellent talk. How deep in the brain can you go with these techniques? And in the long term, what kind of a limit might that put on the behaviors that you can control? Yeah. So <clears throat> with conventional to photon light shaping, we can go as deep, as deep as the scattering led us to go. So I would say it's between 200 to 500 micrometer. Temporal focus is very useful to to make the the spot shape very clean. So they actually for reasons that I won't have to, time to explain, but it's very useful to, to, to decrease the interaction between ballistic and non-ballistic photons, so you can preserve this shape very deep. To go deeper, we are now working in, in, in uh, developing three photon holography, so, but it's a little bit too early to show any results on that. And if you really want to reach very deep brain region, then you have to go with the, this green lens, and this is why we developed this fibroscope system. So then the, obje the focalizing objective are those lens which has less than one millimeter of diameter, so you can insert them very deep in the brain. 
Thank you very much. So he's a research uh, staff member at the IBM Research um, Europe in Zurich. And um, he's working with uh, scanning probes with atomic force microscopy and scanning tunneling microscopy to learn about the interaction of molecules on top of surfaces on a uh, atomic scale. And uh, we are curious what you're going to talk about and we're looking forward to your contribution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're a little bit early in time. I hope my parents are watching already. Hi. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm talking about resolving single molecules. And I'll first show you what I mean with that, and then i show you what that might be good for. So, um, we, in 2009, we showed a technique how you can resolve a single molecule with atomic resolution. So, you all know, like, these chemistry textbook models, this is pentacene, and this is an atomic force microscopy image that we take of such a molecule that is adsorbed on a surface. And we do this with an atomic force microscope. And there's one particular trick that we play and that we found gives us high resolution. And this is we attach a single carbon monoxide molecule to the end of the tip. So this is a, um, oxygen, this is a carbon. The metal tip is behind. And in this technique, you raster scan this tip across the surface to get this image and you record the force between this carbon monoxide molecule on the tip and the pentacene on the surface, and then you get these kind of images. The next slide is just a little bit technical to give you an idea. So this is how our home-built microscope looks like. It's ultra-high vacuum and low temperature, um, so we work at 5 Kelvin. In the middle, you see the sensor that we are using. So that is the prong of the AFM. And this oscillates with an amplitude of one atomic diameter, one angstrom. And at the end, you have the tip of this microscope. Here you see a focus ion beam image. And then at the end, we pick up this carbon monoxide molecule in the system, and we take these images. OK, that was what we were doing. And now, what is it good for? So of course, there is a very direct application, and that is identifying molecules. So this is a metabolite hauled up from a submarine from the Mariana Trench, and it was difficult to assign this molecule, and by taking images, we could actually help resolving it. And this is important to look at these metabolites for new cures and medicines, but this is a niche application of our technique. Usually, if you have all the same molecules, then nuclear magnetic resonance and mass spectrometry are the gold standards, and usually you get the structure. But if you have a substance that has very many different molecules, then these uh, averaging techniques, uh, they have a challenge to assign the different structures. And now here comes our unique uh, capability in that we can assign a molecule based on a single molecule. So if we have a mixture of molecules, we can study this mixture one by one. And here we did this in suit. So these are all AFM images. On the left-hand side, you see the question that we tried to address. And this is how soot particles form in the flame of a combustion engine. And then later, they form Feinstaub and soot, which is not good for health. And um, what was missing, basically, was um, how do these planar aromatics aggregate and form larger clusters? And here, um, this is uh, from another work showing the question, basically. And here was um, proposed that these are pi radicals, and actually this is just a selection of hundreds of molecules that we image, and in those we see some that then can actually help to explain us this nucleation pathway, which was the pressing question of this combustion community, and here you see some pi radicals, so these are very reactive molecules that can form bonds in this flame, and this is already a product of such molecules that had been formed in the flame. So here we use the single molecule sensitivity. There's another thing, and this I like even more than the single molecule imaging, and this is atom manipulation. So we can actually do things with our tip. So we can um, introduce chemical reactions on a single molecule. And this is a recent example here, and here we showed that we can induce selective reactions. So we can start with this molecule in the center. This is again an AFM image. And we can now select whether we want to form that molecule or we want to form that molecule by changing a bias pulse that we use to attach electrons to this molecule. And so this is also reversible, so we can go either way here and we can go back and forth and really select which bonds to form in a molecule with atomic precision. And this could be interesting for future artificial molecular machines where you might exploit this selectivity and that you can control these reactions on a single molecule. 
Okay, this brings me already to the final slide. So it's a very recent result, just published two weeks ago in Nature. And here we use our technique to make molecules and study them that you cannot make otherwise. And these are often very reactive molecules. And here we try to make a new allotrope of carbon. So that is a ring of just two-fold coordinated carbon atoms. Um, in this case, 16 of them. And, then, and we can make them on our surface again using the tip to do chemistry. Here we get precursors from our chemistry collaborators, and these have masking groups, in this case bromine and CO. And here you see an image of the precursor. And now by applying voltage pulses with our tip on this molecule, we can take off these masking groups and we can make this molecule and then we make this molecule. And finally we get this ring molecule. And now um, we can also now study it. And here our technique, it does not only um, show you basically the atoms, but you also get information on the strengths and the lengths of bonds. And here in, in these cyclocarbons, there's often the question whether these are cumulonic structures or polyionic structures, meaning whether they have just double bonds all around or they have alternating short and long bonds, triple and single bonds. And with our AFM, we see these um, short triple bonds as bright protrusions. So we can actually, from this image, tell that this molecule is in the structure with alternating long and short bonds. And what's also interesting in this particular molecule, and this is maybe more for um, the chemistry experts in the audience, is that um, this is actually an anti-aromatic carbon allotrope. It has two pi systems that are orthogonal and each is occupied by 16 electrons rendering it highly anti-aromatic, doubly anti-aromatic. And with this, I'm already at the end of my talk. I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators and my funding agencies, and I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope for a discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Leo, uh, for this uh, excellent presentation. And uh, we have time for a number of questions. Go ahead. Otherwise, maybe I start. So, um, can you give me an idea? So, you study the molecules on surfaces. So, what is the limitation of the surfaces that you can use at the moment? And maybe what are the plans? What combinations of molecules on surfaces mm -hmm. uh, do you hope to investigate in the future? Thanks for the question. So, if we study these very reactive molecules that you cannot make otherwise because they're so reactive, we have to use very chemically inert surfaces so that they don't form bonds to the surface. And here we use um, often sodium chloride, so just table salt that we grow as a thin layer on our single uh, metal single crystals. Or sometimes we use even a monolayer of xenon that's even less reactive if we want to study these molecules uh, on the surface. And uh, one main limitation since you ask about it, so this technique is really good to study planar molecules. That's more from their imaging mechanism. If the molecules get into 3D, we can basically only look at the surface. It's a very surface sensitive technique. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So we have time for more questions. Don't be shy. Uh, there's one, yeah. Hmm? What would it take to get this technique to work on cells, for example? Study. Yeah, <laughs> so this, this uh, would be really difficult. No? So we work at this ultra high vacuum and low temperature because we need these super clean conditions and super stable conditions. Nothing is allowed to move. We, want, we see every dirt atom. Um, but there are ideas to use similar methods using the same sensors, for example, in, in liquids. And, and also there, there has been atomic resolution reported it's not as high as you can get here, but um, yeah, people are working on this, and there's quite some progress. And I, and I hope we can get first to liquid samples, and then maybe even to biological samples. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So the next speaker is uh, Thomas Klinger, and uh, Thomas uh, is at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics in Greifswald, and he also leads uh, there the large superconducting stellarator project Wendelstein 7X, and uh, yeah, we are very interested in hearing about fusion and maybe the physics of plasmas. Thank you. Yes, a little bit. Uh, thanks, Oliver. Um, all right, so this is um, about nuclear fusion, and it's an old story but there's some news in it. Um, otherwise, I would not stand here. 
So what is fusion? So simply speaking, fusion uh, is the complement of fission. So fission is splitting heavy nuclei, fusion is fuse light nuclei. And um, it's actually pretty straightforward. So uh, we are just transforming mass into kinetic energy according to E equals mc squared. Yes? And so that's a very fundamental process. So you can transfer mass into energy and vice versa. Yes? So that's a very uh, elementary process. And um, fusion is known to power the stars. So that's the mechanism that is happening in the, in the uh, center, in the core of the stars. And so it is very tempting to, uh, to try to do that in a small version on Earth. Yes? But it's not so straightforward, I can tell. Um, fusion Earth means, uh, first of all, since it's an elementary process, um, we need many fusion reactions. And so if you go into the figures, uh, we need something like 10 to the 18 fusion reactions per second and cubic meter in order to get macroscopic um, energy that is useful for mankind. Of course, with each fusion process, energy is released, but it's very little. It's an elementary process. And uh, the approach, if you choose the approach to uh, use a, a, a low density plasma, that means a thin gas, um, 100 thousandths of an atmosphere, so it's just a low pressure, low density gas, you have to pay a price. So you have to heat uh, up the gas to even a factor of 10 above the temperature of the, in the core of the sun, 120 million degrees centigrade. But okay, fine, uh, a thin gas can be heated up to these temperatures without too much effort. But uh, since on Earth, this uh, hot gas, which we call plasma, is surrounded by a solid, and the solid is basically at room temperature, we need a very good insulation. And again, if you cast into the numbers, uh, it's 50 times better than polystyrene. So there are uh, some exercises to do. Um, and uh, how is it done? Uh, the one, one approach is not the only one, but one approach, and that's the approach we are doing, is magnetic confinement. And magnetic confinement is using magnetic fields, since we are dealing with charged particles in, in the plasma. The part, charged particles are subject to the Lorentz force. And uh, you are getting um, this gyro motion here, which is indicated here. This is a single magnetic field line. And it turns out that the torus uh, topology is the best choice for the magnetic field line. And it's not only a torus, but it's also a torus with a twist. That means the magnetic field lines must be twisted to compensate for uh, radial uh, gyro center drifts. You have a gyro motion, and these gyro centers uh, are drifting radially out wide, uh, out wide, uh, outwards if you do not twist the magnetic field lines. Um, and uh, I may ask for the movie here, so you can just uh, trace these particles, and so you can see the gyro motion, and the gyro motion, the gyro center of the gyrating particles is then moving like this, and so it's not spiraling around the torus, which is basically expected first, but you are getting a pendulum motion, and this is just a magnetic mirror. It's a magnetic mirror effect, because a magnetic field in the center is higher and uh, lower outside, so this is just the outcome of the, of the toral topology. And so, so you are getting trapped particles, and that's a very basic idea of the whole thing. And so it's a trapping of particles, and so therefore the magnetic field is forming a kind of a magnetic vessel for the charged particles, and that's called magnetic confinement. And here's actually the, the whole physics in. So you can uh, trace these particles, how the particle behavior is, and it depends very sensitively on the magnetic field topology. And so we are talking a lot about shaping the magnetic field. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you what is then the pinnacle of the whole, uh, of the whole development uh, called Wendelstein 7X, a big machine built in Greifswald. Uh, and it is called a stellarator, a stellarator that brings a star to the Earth. And um, this is a magnetic field shape. And this is the outcome of 20 years of very detailed physics work and very hard physics work. And so all the physics is in this particular geometry of the magnetic field. And since the uh, charged particles are bound to the magnetic field, this is also the shape of the plasma. And so all the physics is already shown here. And this, the physics is done by tracing all these particles, by putting it together by uh, satisfying stability condition, uh, pro properties, et cetera, et cetera. There's a long list of optimization criteria. So the physics is done here. Now the engineering starts. You need coils. 
uh, that create this magnetic field shape and a certain shape magnetic field means shape coils, a full stop. It's just the inverse of, the, of Maxwell's equations. You can just calculate the coils. So these are superconducting coils, just normal superconductor, now we have titanium. Uh, and, and since we're experimental physics, we're also adding 20 planar coils in order to have more degrees of freedom to, um, to change the magnetic field, to vary the magnetic field. Uh, then everything must be um, bolted to a massive central ring. These coils have a dead weight of six tons, three meter diameter. The magnetic forces are up to 150 megapascals, 100, so something like, like 100 tons, 150 tons. And so this all must be supported, they must be wired, they must be supplied with liquid helium, and everything must be cooled down to minus 270 degrees centigrade because it's superconductivity. Uh, and so we also need a cryostat. And so the cryostat is formed by the outer vessel and the cryo volume is between the actual pl plasma vessel, so the ultra high vacuum vessel and the outer vessel. And in the end, the machine looks like this. Okay, so like an evil death star in, uh, in a cheap, uh, in a cheap uh, science fiction movie. Uh, right, and uh, so that's the reality on the left hand side. So this is like the machine appears if you visit it, 1000 tons. Uh, it took uh, 1.3 million uh, work hours to build it, 17 years. So it's a big machine, typical big science machine. And that's a view into the machine. So the whole wall is covered with graphite, water-cooled steel, um, carbon fiber reinforced carbon to cope with the 10 megawatt per square meter uh, heat fluxes on there. Everything is water-cooled. And so we have a, a completely water-cooled in vessel system with 600 30 cooling circuits going into the ultra high vacuum, which is a nightmare in its own. Um, and that's the plasma on the right hand side. Just see it uh, visualized with, with a normal camera, with a, with a video camera. And these are the plasma parameters. So we are having plasma heating in megawatts, five megawatt of microwaves are put in. Then we are getting a certain plasma density, plasma temperature, which is something a little bit, little bit below uh, 30 million degrees, 3 keV. Here the plasma energy, everything nicely constant, 30 seconds, fine. So we extended it even to up to 500 seconds. All right. Um, and that's the outlook to um, a power station, so a future power station based on the Wendelstein concept. So here are the major parameters. So one needs about 1,400 cubic meter of plasma volume. Wendelstein 7 x and Greifswald has 30 cubic meter plasma volume. But we need the volume because the energy is created in the volume. The losses go over the surface. And so it's a volume to surface ratio that must be put right. And unfortunately, physics tells us it doesn't go smaller. So we cannot build a small pocket like fusion power station. Uh, but it delivers a one gigawatt power station. And so that's actually just fine. And uh, this is the process, so the elementary process, it's a fusion of deuterium and tritium, uh, creating helium and neutrons, and of course, a surplus of kinetic energy. All right. Uh, last word. So the fusion fuel is fascinating because it's one kilogram fusion fuel, deuterium, helium, uh, deuterium uh, uh, and tritium, delivering 30 gigawatt hours electric energy. And so for one, gigawatt power station, it's a full day. So the fuel, you're bringing one kilogram fuel in and you run the, the really big power station for a full day. That's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for scaring us with this uh, machine. <laughs> I'm sure there are some questions. Please go ahead. What are your thoughts on the tritium supply issue? Because that would seem to be the biggest single bottleneck. Yeah, yeah tri tritium is a headache, indeed. So because uh, tritium is an un unstable, unstable nucleus, so it doesn't exist simply. So there's no, there are no tritium reservoirs. So tritium must be generated. It would not make sense to generate tritium in a fission power plant to run a fusion power plant. So there is the process to generate the tritium in situ in the fusion power plant by breeding tritium from the neutron reaction with lithium. And so you need lithium. And you could say then you are competing with batteries, but look, one kilogram so for a day, it's fine. When will you fill in uh, tritium for the first time in your experiment? Never. If we have because everything will be contaminated. We have not that. the license. Hmm? And it also makes no sense because the volume is so small 
that the uh, the number of uh, fission reactions or, or the the energy balance would be would be would be uh, just boring. So uh, we are making the input of 10 megawatt of heating power to create the plasma and would get something like one megawatt out if you would put uh, tritium in. And so it's just boring. It's useless. You need your vo the volume. And so we would not learn very much from that. Okay, one last quick question. Can you say anything about what the rest of the power plant would look like? What to what? Is, is it a, if you were to build this, Mm -hmm. uh, would it just be a simple steam cycle? What would the rest of the power plant look oh, like? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. That's actually the appealing thing, that uh, it just creates heat. And so you're taking the power of the sun and you're, you're putting um, a kettle on top. And so you're creating steam and then everything is very conventional. And so basically you can tear down the coal power station uh, and just put in the thing. And actually the size fits pretty well. If you have ever visited one of these big power stations, everything is big there. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Thanks again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Vivet Paul Shetiwar is professor at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, India. And um, he, uh, his research has been dedicated to pioneering novel nanomaterials as catalysts and uh, solar en energy harvesters to combat uh, climate change. And we're looking forward to your uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about a uh, new kind of a material. It's ideally a gold, but which is a black in color. So we all know gold is a very shiny yellow color. And most of the time, it reflects all the solar, solar photon that it sees. But we develop a black gold, which rather than reflecting the light, it harvests almost all the solar light. And, the, and why we are developing such a, such a black gold? Why such a uh, diff different uh, materials? So we all know the climate change is one of the most serious problems that mankind has ever faced. And what if I say that there is a simple solution to combat the climate change, which is you capture the excessive CO2 that is the real reason for the climate change, and you convert them into some useful chemicals. You create some sort of a, a, a circular economy where you have some sort of a catalytic reactor which converts CO2 into fuel using solar energy, so you don't need any external energy, and you burn the fuel, get the energy, do the work, and that CO2 that you are generating, send it back to the same reactor, and you again convert the fuel, right? And if this is possible, in obviously in a sustainable way, you can ideally combat the climate change. Obviously, CO2 is an extremely stable molecule, so why will it convert into anything? So that means I need to put in lots of energy to convert CO2 into, into any uh, value-added products. So what we are trying to do is, we are trying to make these high surface area nanomaterials. So when CO2 sits onto the surfaces, those oxygen gets you know, attracted towards the surface. You are bending the molecule, you are stretching the molecule. That reduces the activation energy barrier. That require, so and then you need a lower energy to, to convert CO2 into useful chemicals. And that remaining energy should come from the solar energy. So what I really need is a material which can activate the CO2 and at the same time, the same material should also harvest the solar photon and transfer that energy to CO2 via a different mechanism. Either it could be through excited electron or through, through a uh, simple thermal energy. How do we design a new materials? So we have developed something called dendritic fibrous nanosilica. It's a silica having a dendritic fibrous morphology, has a unique particle size. Uh, one can tune the particle size, excellent surface area for those who don't know the uh, the value of the surface area, 500 meters of gram, is like if you take a one gram powder in your hand, it's like a one football ground in your hand. So it's a huge surface area that can be utilized to harvest the light, to activate the reactants. And it's simply easy to synthesize. We also try to ask the question that why we are forming such a materials, right? Why a spherical in shape? Why fibrous? Why not a planar structure or a solid sphere? Why a particular shape and size? Because un until you know what the formation mechanism of these materials, you will not able to you know, synthesize a new material that is required to harvest the solar light. So this is the typical mechanism. I will show you the animation to save the time. So we use these uh, molecules. So you know, the blue balls are a polar head of that organic molecule, and the zigzag lines are non-polar tail, CS2, CS2 up to 16 times. So you add the surfactant molecule into the solvent. Our solvent is xylene and water, mixture of polar and non-polar. So the molecules are confused now, and the concentration is such that they try to self-assemble to minimize the total energy of the system. And and they form lamellar phases. 
then you can say there could be repulsion between these polar heads. So we added one more co-surfactant, we go, which go in between these molecules and stabilizes these interfaces where I'm going to synthesize my material. But we also observe that these are not floating flat into the, into the system, but they're in the form of a droplet, microemulsion droplet. And these droplets then became a template to synthesize a different kind of a nanomaterial. So this is a spherical droplet made up of a xylene water and some surfactant molecule. These are not a nanoparticles, but they're nano insides. And then in the channels, you can grow different materials, in this case, silica. Now, only, only drawback of a silica is it's SiO2. So it doesn't do anything by itself. You need to activate the silica. The simpler way is just putting some metal nanoparticles or some organic molecule. You can uh, impart some functionality to these materials. But what I said, I, we no, not only need a, a site which can activate the CO2, but we also need a site which can harvest the solar light. And silica being an insulator cannot harvest any of the solar photon. So what then we try to do is we use the concept of localized uh, uh, surface plasma resonance, LSPR, which has which is more about the electron cloud on the metal nanoparticle resonate with some particular wavelength of the light, and that allows you to harvest those wavelengths of the light in a very simple way of explaining the LSPR. Right? It's more like a, a resonance between the electron cloud and, and particular wavelength of the light. However, if you make, say, 10 nanometer gold, it will harvest, say, 550 nanometer wavelength. If you increase the size, you will get a different wavelength. But if you really want to design a good photocatalytic system, then you should harvest all the solar photon that is coming from the sun, which is from, say, visible to near IR, which is not possible by simply changing the size of the nanoparticle. So what we did then, we came up with the idea that you bring lots of these gold particles closer, and then the electron cloud of the gold, gold particles start coupling with each other, called the uh, plasmonic coupling. They start talking with each other, and they together then resonate with, with different wavelengths of the light, and ideally you should get a, a broadband light absorber. So this is a typical synthesis protocol, simply tuning the nucleation and growth process. You, we were able to tune the distances between these nanoparticles. And now you can see by, look at the color. Sim if you take a simple gold nanoparticle, it harvests around 550 nanometer. But by simply tuning the gaps, you see you now get a broadband light absorption from 400 nanometer to 1100 nanometer. In the physical way, the gold becomes black. It is still a gold, still a metallic gold, no change in the oxidation state. You know, no, no functionalization, nothing. It's, it's simply the particle size distribution and the plasmonic coupling, which gives you the, the black gold, which harvests entire solar photon. So after making this material, we were very really excited. I said, okay, now we have a material which should act as a very good catalyst, because it is harvesting lots of photon. But when we did the catalysis, although we see the activity, say, better than reported in the literature, but if you look at the number, it's 1.5 micromole per gram. And we're talking about 40 gigatons of the CO2 per year. So there's no correlation. So then we ask this very basic question that if I have a material which can harvest so many photons, then why it is not active? Then we realize it's not only about harvesting the solar photons, but also about once you create these ex exciton, what uh, uh, one of the speakers explained, the, the, the lifetime of these electrons need to be good. Right? The, the, most of the time, when electron goes to the excited state, they will couple back with the hole, and the electron cannot go to the CO2. So, so in order to solve that issue of a lifetime, what we did, we came up with the idea that, okay, you are generating these hot electrons in black gold. You, you add one more uh, material, say a nickel, where the electron will move from gold to nickel. You, the electron is in a nickel state, and hole is in a gold state. You're separating them, creating a heterojunction, and possibly that will have a better lifetime. We designed the catalyst like that, and you can see now, I skip all of that. I will show you the activity directly. Now look at the catalytic activity, it was 1.5 micromole per gram using black gold. As soon as I add a nickel, it is changed to 2,500 millimole per gram. It's just a huge jump in the activity by simply tuning the, how the electron behaves uh, when, when you are creating those hot electrons. Right, so uh, it's a stable material, right? It, it, has, it has a stability up to 100 hours. Ideally, in reality, it should be for years that you cannot test in the lab, but this uh, spectra shows that it is, it is it is active for a longer time. Right, with that, I, I, I like to thank you for listening to me. Thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting insights and uh, questions and comments. Ah, I see one over there in the very back. Hmm? One, two, three. Um, hi, thank you for the nice presentation. I have a very uh, application-based question. How do you think this is much better than normal electrochemical CO2 reduction? 
where you take in energy from a renewable source and do it on the other side. So why do you combine this yeah, together? That's, that's a very good question. One can, one can do the electrochemistry, generate the electricity, find the battery, store the battery, get the lithium, right? You can do that. But I'm saying you don't need battery, you don't need lithium. Take the photon, add into the CO2. It's like CO2 is acting as a storage, CO2 is acting as a battery. Right to, to store your solar energy into the CO2 in the form of a chemicals, right? And once you have these gaseous or liquid chemical, that's how we are still running our show, right? So it's still, I think that is a better way rather than the electrochemistry. Obviously, currently, the electrochemistry has a better activity than the, the photochemistry. But once we achieve a better, once we design a better catalytic material, I think photo will be always better than, than electro or a thermo. Just another question. Uh, what are your products that you form and what is the efficiency? This is my last question. The efficiency I gave you in the form of a millimole per gram, which is uh, 2,500 millimole per gram, which is a good number. The product we form is a CO. So you just convert CO2 <laughs> into CO, and CO is known as a, CO plus hydrogen is known as a syn gas, a synthetic gas. So by converting CO2 to CO, you can ideally make anything after that. You take that CO, make alkenes, alcohols, polymers, whatever you, whatever you like. So that's why it's very important to convert CO2 to CO. And, and that's, that's the, the product. Thanks for a nice presentation. I have a question about the fouling and the blockage of the pores of your uh, porous material. Can you comment on uh, this process? Because this is when the methane basically formed or it may happen. And Yes, that's a very important question. So see, the one of the uniqueness of a DFNS over any porous material like MOV or SVA or MCM41, is more like a marigold flower. So you can enter from anywhere, the reactant can enter from anywhere and product can come from anywhere. Whereas all other porous material have one entry and one exit point. In terms of reduction in the surface area, when you load the gold nanoparticle onto it, you will reduce. So say 600 becomes 300 uh, meters square per gram, which is still a good number. And we're not blocking them because it's happening at a lower temperature. Ideally, you're not giving any temperature, it's just a light. The, real, the natural temperature that it uh, produces is around 200 degrees Celsius, 250 degrees Celsius in between that. And so there's no carbon formation. So there's no blocking. So we showed it to you for 100 hours. There was no blocking of any pores or active site. OK, I think there were two or three questions. Maybe there's one super urgent question that must ask now. OK. <laughs> Can you say something about the economics if you try to scale that those converters unfortunately uh, use expensive materials. In the catalytic converters in cars, rhodium or platinum, if you scale it up, how much gold do you need? Nickel is cheaper, but uh, still quite expensive. Yes, yes, that's a very important question. So whenever you show this uh, expensive metal, that's the first question, right? But I have a very different take on this. Obviously, gold is expensive. Obviously, PT is expensive. But let us assume that I need just a one gram of a catalyst to convert one ton of a CO2 into something. And that one gram catalyst is stable for a year. Whereas I have a catalyst made up of iron or a nickel, which is very cheap, but they deactivate, say, within a day or a two day. So I think the, the commercial aspect has to be considered with respect to the stability of the catalyst. So if you can build a stable catalyst, so even if it is a gold, I think it should be okay. It should be okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Arne Thomas is a chemist and a head of the Functional Materials Group here at uh, in Berlin at the Technische Universität. And uh, he's interested in nanostructured and especially nanoporous inorganic and organic materials. And uh, I suppose we learn something about them and about the applications. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and of course for the invitation. And yes, I hope you learned something about porous materials and their application right now. Um, oh, I left this over there. So, but let me, let me start with a statement. Uh, we don't have an energy problem. We have enough energy. We have this big fusion reactor um, which provides actually, and it is said, um, some people calculated this, so one hour, so the sunlight strike on Earth's surface in one hour delivers enough energy to power the world economy for an entire year. So, we have enough sustainable energy, no problem. What we have indeed is an energy conversion problem because always when we have this energy, uh, we don't need it actually because then it's warm and, and light and uh, what we need or when we need the energy then it's dark and cold. So we have to store the energy and that's a big problem. So we have to convert sunlight into storable energy forms 
you can think of a battery, but actually really long-term storage is just possible in molecules, which means chemical energy. Um, and it, there are factories all around us actually doing this type of energy conversion of photons into molecules. And you just um, see them here and there and there and outside. Of course, plants have um, evolutionary optimized the conversion of photons into molecules. Um, here in this case, we just heard about it actually, the conversion of CO2 into carbohydrate and water into oxygen. And um, it would be nice, of course, doing artificial systems which can work like the photosystem in plants. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but more the concept is interesting here. So what nature is doing is it uses molecules for certain purposes and it couples them together. So you have actually molecules which can absorb photons, that's the chlorophylls, and you have cofactors transferring energy or charge carriers to a catalytic active center, where then, for example, in photosystem 2, the water splitting is occurring. And this concept would be very interesting actually to transfer to artificial systems. Um, there will be no, even the best synthetic chemist in the world cannot actually synthesize an enzyme so far and not such a catalytic system, so we have to simplify this. And now let's think, how can we actually connect such molecules, functional molecules together in probably a solid, because solids are much more suitable for catalysis. Um, probably in a way like um, you all might, might probably have played or had to play actually with these chemical toolboxes in school uh, where you can visualize molecules or, or ionic crystals. And the same concept could be thought of actually is that you connect molecules together to open framework structures. Here's an example how it works. So here are two molecules, so trigonal planar rigid molecules. The chemist sees directly here's an amine bond and an aldehyde bond, so they can be connected to imines. The non-chemists just think of two triangles which we connect by the edges, and then we can predict how the structure should look like of such a material. So this is actually the prediction. If I put triangles together in a planar way, then I should have a 2D layer which forms a honeycomb structure, or a 2D hexagonal structure, as we call it. And that would be the material we are producing here, so we have to find the right conditions to do this. It's a reversible fashion synthesis, so that then the thermodynamic stable um, material is formed, and this is crystalline. So, okay, PowerPoint can always show something like crystalline structures, but seeing is believing. So here we have a very nice electron microscopes here in Berlin. So we can visualize these structures, and if you, if you look closer to them, you see it's a nicely ordered structure, and it's indeed forming this two-dimensional honeycomb structure. And it's an open framework. So we just heard about porous materials. So this has surface areas of 1,000 square meter to 2,000 square meter, sometimes even 2,700 square meter per gram, because it's very lightweight. And so you see actually ex everything here is accessible from the outside. So you have these large void spaces. And probably people working in organic electronic have spotted it already. So these are fully conjugated systems. So these are organic semiconductors. This is actually an electron donor, this is an electron acceptor, and by changing actually the molecular entities or moieties we have in these structures, we can actually also change the band cap and the color of the materials, so that in the end we can absorb actually the entire visible light. Now coming back actually to our reaction, I said actually we have these chemical factories transforming, converting photons into molecules. Um, which is an interesting reaction per se. We just heard CO2 reduction is, of course, one of the most important reactions. With these catalysts, we can also do CO2, photocatalytic CO2 reduction, but now I will talk about a presumably more simpler reaction, actually, and that would be the splitting of water. Same reaction, so you have to use energy to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And this is then an energy carrier, because green hydrogen is one of the most promising energy carriers we have. And this is not a new idea. Let me just say as a side note, 1875, uh, Jules Verne, in the um, novel The Mysterious Island, said already that water will be the coal of the future. Ten years before the combustion enzyme, the first combustion enzyme were commercialized. Yeah? And then, unfortunately, oil was so cheap that we more or less wasted, in retrospect, 150 years of research on hydrogen generation and usage in fuel cells. 
Think about where we would have been if we would start at 8075 or when the first fuel cells was or even 20 years uh, before, yeah, when we would have put the research efforts of combustion engines into fuel cells and electrolyzers. Yeah. Okay, but okay, it's nowadays actually you have heard about all these initiatives. Hydrogen is needed, so we produce already 90 million tons of hydrogen for chemicals, for industry, for transport. And now we want to do this, of course, in a green way, which means actually. Um, so far, it's steam reforming. It's all coming from fuel gas. More or less all hydrogen we are producing is coming from methane, from fuel gas. And when you produce 90 million tons of hydrogen, you produce double the amount of CO2. And this we want to change, of course. And we can do this probably by photocatalysis. And now you see this structure again, a little bit different. Um, and you don't have to look at the details. I will just explain you what we have now coupled together. One molecule is a photosensitizer. This is an acridine, which is a typical dye molecule. This here is a typical bipyridine. This is a ligand for a metal. You can put a metal on it, which could be a metal catalyst then for hydrogen formation. And then you have to couple it by a pi conjugated system, which is actually the entire system. And then at least, of course, it's not the complexity of nature, which we see here, but then actually the photons can be absorbed by the acridine dyes. Electrons can be transferred to the molecular catalyst. And um, as I said, this might then um, reduce the protons in water to hydrogen. Not as complex as a photosystem, of course, but let's say at least inspired by it. And I just want to show you how such an experiment is working. So let's see if we can start the movie. So here you see the reddish material. We just disperse it here on a piece of filter paper. And um, this is then going into a photoreactor. You put water on it, shine light on it, actually from above in this case with LEDs or solar simulators. And then you see actually the hydrogen bubbles occurring. And that would be a very simple system, of course, to produce hydrogen, probably also in a decentralized way so that everyone can produce its own hydrogen for a fuel cell car at his house or something. Yeah, like actually also inspired by nature, same concept, have very very much small reactors actually produce um, yeah, molecules by photocatalysis. Okay, with this, we can let it run. Actually, during the questions, I think <laughs> there will be uh, one more light source, which is in a solar simulator. But you can actually see how we produce the hydrogen. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for this uh, great presentation. And uh, yeah, time for questions. There's one. I, w I wondered how the conversion efficiency compares to first producing the electricity per standard solar cells and then getting the hydrogen from that. Yeah. I mean, maybe I missed it. Yeah. Very good question, of course, and often asked question. <laughs> um, so um, we compare, okay, let's say like this. Yeah? In an optimized system, we are in a quantum efficiency. The best systems are 20% or something, which is the same which you get with an optimized solar cell electrolyzer system. That's the best system. I think actually we are in our labs, the best one was 10% or something like this. Um, but we have not really optimized this, I have to say. So just dispersing things on filter paper, there's so much scattering in this thing. So I think actually just from an engineering point, if I would give this to an engineer, he would actually raise this by 10% immediately, I guess. More question over there, I think, yeah. Uh, concerning the electrolysis reaction, uh, I read recently that like there was a lot of experience with um, with the bubbling. Like there's the bubbling usually hinders the electro electrolysis process, so you want to get rid of the bubbles which are on the surface very fast. Uh, something like, for example, with ultrasonication or something. Have you tried something like this to yeah. improve your system further? Wow, this is now a pro question, let's say. Because, of course, you have to think about, you make bubbles of hydrogen, you make gases which have to escape these very small pores, which are just one nanometer in size. This is a lot of overpotential which is happening there. We have seen, actually, when we make hierarchical structures, which means we introduce large, larger pores of micrometers into these microporous materials, which we can do by templating approaches. Then, actually, it's, it's, um, we increase the um, efficiency by a factor of three or four to avoid the overpotential by bubble formation. That's, that's a very interesting point, yeah. Since these are organic frameworks, what's the lifetime in practical use? And do you have to do thermal management? 
Yeah, so thank you for this question. So um, any chemist will see an imine bond, which I showed in the beginning, is not water stable, not for a long time. And if you put acids or bases on it, then even worse. I would be very careful with these questions two years ago, but now we have developed systems which are super rock stable, really, so which are fully aromatic. So actually this one here, uh, <laughs> who can look very close, can see that the structure is a bit different than the one showed. Uh, and it is a fully aromatic system, so which is quinoline bonds, and you can put acids on it, bases, you can boil it in water. And I think actually these are very promising systems. Of course, uh, we just heard it lab scale, so we can do it 40 hours or something like this. Industry will say, yeah, great, 40 hours, we need two years or so. This we couldn't test so far, but at least from the chemistry, we are at a point that I can say these materials are really, really stable. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Aman Al Ashuri, and he's here from Berlin, from the Helmholtz Centrum for Materials and Energy, and uh, he has been developing uh, world record efficiency perovskite-based solar cells, and uh, also they are commercialized. I learned, and uh, so I'm sure we're going to hear something about this and uh, the perspectives uh, of the future of these systems. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. And let me start with our motivation. What, what is the biggest challenge humanity currently faces? And I would argue it is this here. The temperature over time, the average temperature on Earth over time, we are skyrocketing out of the safe zone in which agriculture could thrive and humanity could rise to its size currently. And we know what's the reason, it is greenhouse gases. We also know where these greenhouse gases come from. Of course, we can do personal choices to reduce our carbon footprint, which is important and good, but the lion's share is coming from energy generation. And we need to change energy generation a lot and fast. Luckily, there are solutions already, as we also heard from a previous speaker, and I want to visualize this. If this is the energy we use within a year in the whole world, then, of course, as said, we have this very nice uh, um, energy source eight light minutes away from us. This is what the energy delivered to the Earth is. It is huge, humongous. It is more than enough. So what do we use of this? We only use this very tiny amount. If you look at heating and electricity together, it's, less, it's around 1% of the energy we use. So the mission is very clear. We need to raise this bubble to much, much higher values. We need to plaster everything with solar cells, right? The solution is really near. And the solar revolution actually has taken place already. If you look at the market, this is where the revolution has already taken place. Look at the solar cell prices. These have fallen down in an unprecedented race within the last uh, decades. So now solar energy is the cheapest form of energy. It's cheaper than gas and coal. <clears throat> but there are limitations. There is a wall to break here. Silicon solar cells only can get as efficient. There is around 24 or 25% and much more than that won't be reached. And when you look at predictions here, so this yellow line on the right graph, this is also what is known by the institutes, right? And also by the research communities. This wall, how can it be broken? There are several ways to do this. And we think the most promising way is to stack solar cell materials on top of each other that are optimized to convert different parts of the solar spectrum as efficiently as possible and to work together, basically. So, you, for, for example, when you stack two cells, you would have a tandem solar cell, which then can reach efficiencies of over 30%, or a triple solar cell going to 35%, realistically. This is what we pursue at Helmholtz Centrum Berlin. So, there are two missions now that we think are, are important to pursue. First, to boost existing sol silicon solar cells, because silicon is an amazing material to use. There's a lot of it, and it's also very easy to handle, so to say, once you know how to do it. Um, so boosting them, these existing lines, but also to accelerate the rate of production of the solar cells is very important. Just imagine you print out solar cells like newspaper. This would be basically the dream of solar cell research, right? And we work on a material class in HZB that can do both these things at once. These are metal halide perovskites. So you see there a vial with a solution. This is because from an ink, you can basically produce the solar cells from metal halide perovskites. So you could actually print them out. This is one way of producing them. <clears throat> Why do we want to boost silicon solar cells? 
because they are dominating the market, right? Silicon is ubiquitous and they are very good. So if you want to, if you now ask yourself, should you wait for perovskite solar cells or just buy for your roof, just buy silicon solar cells, okay? Because they are very good, but we want not to compete with silicon. We want to have it as an add-on. So perovskites can boost the silicon. So taking silicon, boosting them by a small amount of perovskite, and you then reach a very simple tandem solar cells in which the perovskite top cell is very good in transforming the visible spectrum or the visible part of the solar spectrum into electricity and silicon remains in having a, a very high efficiency in converting into infrared photons into electricity. And look at the numbers here, 500 nanometers of perovskite is enough to reach the same efficiency as silicon in this case. So that's why only the small vial of perovskite solution is enough, for example, if I would have such a vial, it would be enough to produce solar cells that would cover my personal energy needs throughout the year. <clears throat> a perovskite solar cell itself is quite simple. So you're basically, if you just have a glass electrode um, sandwiched between two materials that are separating electrons from holes, this is what a solar cell basically does, right? You generate electron hole pairs, um, ideally with high lifetimes, and then you need to help the charge carriers reach the electrodes. So electrons go to the top here, holes to the bottom. But we soon found out within the last years that you can tune as much as you like the perovskite itself, but the most important tuning is happening at the interfaces. So the device is its interfaces, as some uh, um, semiconductor specialist says, right? And this is especially true for perovskite solar cells. So we then try to understand this and master how to optimize the interfaces with especially organic molecules that are compatible to both the inorganic electrodes and the hybrid inorganic organic perovskite material. And you can do this in single junction solar cells, but the real challenge is to do this in the tandem solar cell, right? Because you don't only have two interfaces, but a lot of layers in this tandem stack, and you need to optimize all of these interfaces and also uh, optically optimize the thicknesses of the layers, but also electrically optimize to reduce non-radiative recombination, namely at the interfaces, by energetic alignment, but also defect trap density, and this is what we have uh, done in the last years, fortunately successfully, because HZB is now recognized on the, on, the, on the world stage, so to say, in this hall of fame of researchers NREL efficiency chart, where you see different solar cell technologies. And on the top here, perovskite silicon solar cells, they are among the highest, uh, um, highly efficient solar cells that you can build, so to say, at a very cheap price. And um, HZB now has four entries in this, and our most efficient solar cell uh, with silicon and perovskite has an efficiency of 32.5%, which far outpaces what silicon can do. So realistically, as I said, 24, 25% for silicon in the lab, maybe 26 point something. But now it's easy to go over 33% with silicon perovskite. And you see the rate at which this accelerated, because of course, we also took some knowledge from the organic PV community and so on, but. It, is, uh, it shows how promising this material is. Now we are focusing on advanced analysis, trying to, to understand the reliability, to build setups that are not yet there in the market, <clears throat> to make them compatible, for example, with flexible substrates, with textured substrates. And uh, now, of course, we also work hard on thinking how to quickly commercialize the findings that are being done here in Berlin. And with this, thank you for your attention. If this sparked your interest, please just uh, reach out to me. Yeah, thank you very much, Amran, for this uh, exciting insights. And I see a question in the very back. Yeah. Hi. Uh, if I may, I'll, two questions. On the science side, you talked about probing the interface. How do you probe or do you probe just the interface or the interface itself without all the other complications of your other layers and your device? Yeah, important question, yes. Usually we try to isolate the interfaces by, for example, uh, reflection absorption infrared spectroscopy that can do, uses some nonlinear effects. You can probe the interfaces when you use organic molecules. But this is a very hard technique and one of the most difficult questions because when you analyze only the interface and then try to transform this into the device, you are being surprised because the device doesn't care about what you've looked at the interface before. So you, you, in the end, you need to take the full device and try to simulate it and then correlate with, for example, energetic measurements. 
And my second question is, you said, some, you said you've achieved 33% in the NREL chart. How does that translate to uh, actual real-world devices in terms of uh, long-term stability as well as scalability? Yeah, <clears throat> that's, the, that's a question most perovskite researchers fear because uh, actually stability is maybe, I would say, the biggest issue because it's this organic, it's a malleable, it's, very, it's a soft material, basically. Um, the ions move, and sometimes you're lucky and the ions move to the right interfaces to increase your efficiency. But, um, well, now you can say there are accelerated aging tests, for example, like, I don't know, 2,000 hours at 90 degrees, and they remain stable if you do everything correctly. But um, I would say it's still far from silicon. So you can outside test for uh, one or two years. This is fine, but not the 30 years of silicon. There's still a re research to be done. So we have time for more. this one. Yes, please. Uh, the microphone is given to you. Just wait a second. Thanks. Probably also a very often asked question. Have not followed it over the last year. So the lead problem, has this somehow solved or? Can you comment on this? So lead, um, some would say we were gifted with lead, actually, <laughs> because uh, it gives us this very nice defect-tolerant properties in perovskites. It has not been solved by, I mean, replacing it remains a really good challenge, but there is development in layers that can capture the lead. It's a very, very small amount. If you look at the natural occurrence of lead in the soil, it's roughly similar to what would leak out of the module. But still, you can create organic layers um, with frameworks that capture the lead as soon as it's soluble. This is, I think, the most promising way. Thank you. We can allow maybe for one more question, if you have one. I don't see a very urgent one at the moment. So then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, now we are through uh, our winner's pitches. And uh, so I think all the speakers did a Fantastic job! It's very difficult, I think, to uh, put a, to put the new results and the motivation and the excitement in only eight minutes. But I think everyone uh, did a fantastic job, and let's give them a warm hand again to all the speakers. Thank you very much. So uh, let's look at the famous picture by Dali, the floating watch. As you can see. Some part of the watch is melting and some part of it is solid. Now, if we look at the structure of this melting state and in the solid state under microscope, we will see the particles are jumbled up in, in the melting state or in the liquid, whereas it's like there are translational order and periodicity in the solid state, as we see in water and ice. But there exists a different variety of solids, specifically like this silicate glass that's holding the ice and water. Uh, if we look at the uh, silicate glass under microscope, like the structure of the silicate glass under microscope, then we'll see the particles are pretty much jumbled up. It's pretty much like the liquid. However, the mechanical properties or the dynamical properties, those are like solids. So in the phase diagram, we see uh, going from liquid to crystal, there is a first order phase transition at the melting point. However, if we cool the liquid very fast, system doesn't get enough time to nucleate, and the nucleation is suppressed, and it ends up being into the glassy state after the glass transition temperature. And I am pretty much interested in polymers, and then for polymers, crystallization is even difficult because it's a long molecule, so finding order is even harder. So often it's end up into the glassy state. And since the structure of the melt and the glasses are pretty much same, then from the statistical uh, physics point of view, it's a problem because there is no stark different in structure, whereas the dynamical property or mechanical property changes a lot. And from engineering perspective, for each of the polymeric material that we use in daily life, we need to know the glass transition temperature precisely. That's because above glass transition temperature, the polymer is rubbery, whereas below the glass transition temperature, it's like a rock solid. So we need to know the glass transition temperature for each of the polymeric material. And I do computer simulation. I model this uh, synthetic polymer into we using some potential with, with some model. And then here I'm showing a bulk polymer melt simulation, and I'm highlighting one of the chains, 
going from high temperature to low temperature. And as you can see, the chain was fluctuating quite a bit at high temperature, and then eventually it goes through the transition and it's frozen. It's like just vibrating around something. And we want to identify the transition. And that's because like, it's extremely essential to identify the TG. You don't want to change your car tire in every season. Or like for acrylic paints, all acrylic polymers has uh, its own TG, or your own glass transition. So we identified some way you, uh, by, uh, apply, by combining uh, this molecular dynamic simulation and machine learning models where we identify the structural fluctuation of each monomer distances and get some order parameter which separates the melt state from the glassy state in a much sharper way. So we get a TG uh, which is like much sharper than the conventional method and we use the microscopic distance as our input descriptor to identify a macroscopic property like the glass transition temperature. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very clear presentation. So, hi, I'm Connor. Uh, four minutes is a challenge, especially for someone as long-winded as me, but I'll give it a good shot. And hopefully I'm interesting. And you can come and talk to me later. So, um, I think everyone, and it was said in the session earlier this morning, knows that we're in kind of a global ecological crisis. And uh, one of the most pressing things that humanity needs to wake up and confront is how we consume carbon. And uh, this is like the carbon cycle on Earth. And this is what I study with uh, colleagues. And in particular, we study it in the ocean, where many molecular details are not yet fully dis um, described or understood with the kind of same rigor that we approach cancer research and things like this. We just, uh, there's a lot of uh, error in our understanding. So what we want to do is try and address this. And this uh, process is not small. Half of CO2 fixation on Earth happens in the ocean by photosynthetic organisms like algae or phytoplankton. And uh, what we do with a consortium of scientists that include chemists, which is me, but also ecologists, uh, microbiologists, uh, genomics, I don't know, I'm going to repeat myself, lots of different disciplines, we come together to try and understand this problem. And what we do is we first understand CO2 fixation and what happens. Because uh, as it was said earlier, CO2 gets turned into an amazing, rich diversity of different types of polysaccharides or glycans. And then, just to sh give you an idea of how big this process is, every second molecule of oxygen that you breathe to stay alive comes from phytoplankton in the ocean. Um, uh, so we study what types of molecules that these phytoplankton make, so we can first understand all these different structures. And then what we try to do is understand how it takes place in this microbial loop. So these molecules are made by phytoplankton, but then things like fungi and bacteria prey and eat these, e each other, but also these polysaccharides. But not all, uh, not all glycans are the same, and you need to evolve enzymatic machinery to uh, destroy these kind of things or digest them. So one such molecule is laminarin, and it's a relatively simple uh, structure, and uh, you need three enzymes to break it down. But, uh, and Therefore, a lot of bacteria can do this kind of degradation. And most of this, like laminarin types of structures, are remineralized and released back to the atmosphere. But we're also interested in these more molecularly complex structures, such as fucoidin, which is, um, if there's specialist bacteria that can eat this. And to eat this, they need 250 enzymes, so much more than three. And even with the 250 enzymes, they can't fully degrade this material. And this means that we are able to detect this kind of material in the sediments that's been stored for over thousands of years. So what we're trying to do is understand what's so special about the structures of these molecules and why is it that an organism that's had millions of years to evolve can't degrade it down to the monomers. So we're developing different types of tools and techniques uh, like fluorescent sensors that we can use to like, um, detect these types of organisms in the ocean, but then also uh, biocatalytic bio kits that we can use to detect and quantify all this organic matter in the ocean. And with that, I'm actually in good time. So thank you. OK, thank you. So yeah, my name is David Kuller. I'm from the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics, um, based in Garching and Greifswald. And I'm a second year PhD student. And I want to take you on a journey uh, through fusion energy and specifically fast ion physics. So sorry, no. 
to sh I don't want to sh show the slide yet. So um, fusion uh, is a dream of the scientific community for more than half a century at this point. Um, and it promises uh, safe and abundant base load electricity and heat production with negligible amounts of fuel consumption, radiation emission, and also no CO2 emissions. Uh, nevertheless, um, the promise of fusion energy cannot uh, deter us from um, addressing the climate crisis right now. Sorry. Um, and my institute were concerned with magnetic confinement fusion, and Thomas Klinger actually showed some nice animations already. Um, so you will recall that we, we confine a plasma toroidally, and um, in a steady state scenario where we want to have our reactor, we have fusion reactions occurring, and these produce a neutron and an alpha particle. Uh, the neutron is non-magnetic, so it's not confined by the magnetic field. It flies out of the plasma, hits the wall, producing heat there, which we can capture and generate electricity. The alpha particle produced is charged, and we want to keep it in the plasma to harness its energy so the plasma perpetually heats it itself. Um, in current devices, we don't have fusion reactions, so we need to rely on external heating and simulations to extrapolate to a future reactor, uh, as long as we don't have it. And um, these simulation codes need to be validated and um, to simulate this alpha heating to, to, so that, we sure, that we're sure in our prediction. And they also need to be 3D capable. Yeah? So on the left, you see a tokamak. And these are uh, nearly axisymmetric machines. But future reactors, which are much larger, will always display 3D effects. Um, so when I play this animation, and it's already started, you will be able to see um, two particles entering. And the top one is a passing particle that's orbiting regularly hel helically around the torus. The, the bottom one is a trap particle which we also call sometimes a banana orbit because of the shape of the orbit looking like a banana. Um, so these three orbits that I show are just snippets of our simulations. Um, we can normally, our simulations contain millions of these particles and up to 100 million. Um, on the right here, you see a stellarator. And as Thomas introduced, these are inherently three-dimensional devices. And um, when I play the animation now, my, mix, my videos are a bit mixed up, um, you will see that the orbit is much more irregular than in a tokamak. So the device itself is more complex. Nevertheless, it has key benefits compared to a tokamak, namely that the plasma is more stable. And um, we can also inherently run the device in steady state. And one further uh, uh, advantage is that we can tailor the magnetic shape of our plasma to exhibit different um, yeah, beneficial properties. So you see that this particle that I, I showed um, has now hit the wall, basically. And we can tailor the shape of the plasma to remove these, wo these uh, wall losses to um, yeah, improve our reactor or actually make it possible um, at all. And um, basically, to, yeah, to uh, be sure in our simulations, um, predicting these, these sorts of things. We need to uh, work on validating them with, uh, on present-day devices and also make them ca as capable as we can to um, yeah, simulate alpha heating in reactors. And that's what I'm working on. So thank you for your attention. So water is the medium of life. Water molecules have a strong dipole moment, and therefore in liquids such as water or even alcohols, there exist strong electric forces. Once a system is represented here, where an organic dye is, is embedded in a medium of, in a pool of polar solvent molecules. At the ambient temperature, these liquid molecules undergo thermal motions. Therefore, the electric forces acting on this embedded chromophore or embedded media is fluctuating, typically at terahertz frequencies. Knowing this, there are like two main things that we would like to talk about. One is, how do these fluctuating electric forces impact the functional and optical properties of the embedded chromophore? And secondly, is there a method by which we can quantify or map the response of these molecules to the presence of an external electric field? In our experiments, we make the use of an electronic absorption spectrum of the chromophore. In the presence of an external electric field, this absorption spectrum shifts, and the shifts can be visualized as the shifts of the transition energy levels of this chromophore. The transition energy level shifts are proportional to the dipole moment of the chromophore. So by mapping 
the spectral shifts, we can learn something about the dipole difference of these chromophores in the two states. Instead of applying or instead of relying on the fluctuating electric forces of the liquid environment, we make use of an external electric field, which is the terahertz pulses, as represented here. In the bottom main panel here, we have the real absorption spectrum of our chromophore, which is given in blue. The terahertz induced changes of this chromophore are given by the symbols. At the first glance, we see an a broadening in the system, which is manifested as an absorption decrease in the center, an absorption increase towards the edges. Now, if we take the time evolution at a particular probe frequency, which is given by the arrow here, we see that the absorbent changes follow the terahertz intensity in time. By taking the numerical analysis of this spectrum, we calculate a dipole difference value of 7.2 dBi between the excited and the ground state for this particular chromophore. Now we would like to look at the same problem from a theoretical standpoint, for which we make use of molecular dynamic simulations and calculate the fluctuating electric field of the liquid. We have two things. One is the really fast fluctuations, and the second is that the amplitude of these fluctuating electric forces are of the same order as that of the external terahertz. So from what we have learned so far, we can expect that the fluctuations in the, or the fluctuating electric forces would impact the transition energy levels and transition energy levels of this chromophore. So, uh, so, we can, uh, so we simulate the electronic absorption spectrum based on this mechanism and experimentally derive delta mu values or the dipole difference values. And we see that our electronic absorption spectrum closely matches the, ex uh, uh, closely matches the uh, theoretical values. So the potential of this method is already shown using this scheme here. And at the moment, we are applying this system to more complex systems such as biomolecules. And thank you. Thanks to all of you. I have a question regarding the polymer uh, research. Uh, as you know, all of the polymers are dispersed, and they don't have special molar mass. And uh, when you have a dispersed polymer, this will affect your glass transition temperature. And what will you do? And or the, in other words, how uh, monodisperse should be your, uh, your, or the dispersity of your sample should be in order to apply your method? Thank you. Uh, for our simulation, we used monodispersity, like we take same mo molecular mass and the chain length is also same because that's easier to simulate. But it will vary, yeah, in real life you have this dispersity problem, so one can look at, it will be, uh, and we think that since we are dealing with the distance as our input feature, one can also include the dispersity in the system and see which chain lengths are, means, there is, will be a distribution of TGs, and then from there we can like connect which distances are like which polymers are contributing to higher TG. So I I think that with our system or with our method we have potential to deal that. But as of now we are using only monodisperse system. Yeah. Thomas Klinger. Yeah. I I have a question to Connor. Um, it's not only about reducing CO2 emission, it's about removal of our sins of 100 years. And so we have to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, as we very well know. Do you see a perspective to store it with your considerations in the oceans? Uh, so that's one obvious thing, consequence of studying molecules that aren't degraded, that they're sequestered carbon. Uh, so I would say we're at the basic science point, where we need to develop tools that we can properly quantify that's amount of carbon that's even stored, and then decide how relevant it is. Is it only in particular types of ecosystems, like certain coastal waters, where in the earth? Does it have to be high salinity? Is it only happen in the Dead Sea, which we can't have the Red Dead Sea everywhere? So these are the types of things we have to figure out first, and then obviously this is like an interesting consequence of the research. Uh, but I would say it's like figure out the, the rules and understand the limitations and the possibilities. But I think yes, in general. 
Okay, thank you. And other? Yeah, yeah question about the fusion to David. So um, <clears throat> you calculate these trajectories and how is it with particle-particle interactions? So can you take them into account? This is super difficult and like what's the mean free path in, in the plasma? So, ooh, sorry. Um, for the so we, I simulate the fast ions, right? And the nice thing is so interactions between the particles that we simulate can be neglected, and this is a pretty good approximation. Um, we of course need to take into account the collisions with the background plasma, right? These fast particles exist in a, in a thermal plasma, and um, so this is modeled as, with collision operators. That um, and that's one part of this this validation exercise to make sure that these are correct and uh, take into account of the, all, of, all of the isotopes and, and masses and stuff like that, yeah. Okay, thank you. There's a question over there. Hi, Connor. Uh, given that the global temperature patterns are changing in the ocean as well as pH, does that have known effects on the uh, ratios of the carbon chains that are being fixed? to these longer ones that might be useful? The length, the length of the carbon. Is that what you said? Sorry, because the glycans, because the Yes, cells what I would say is yes. Basically, we know with all organisms, including humans, you put them under different conditions, different things happen. So I would assume the, tr the truth is the uh, same uh, for plants. So I think if you put like a corn in a certain type of soil, it mightn't grow. And others, it will grow perfectly fine. And I think it's uh, obviously with the ecosystems changing at like dynamic rates and unknown things. So basically, I would say most likely yes, but unknown consequences would be the safest thing to say. I wouldn't have a strong feeling if it's going to be better or worse. But uh, maybe other people in the room are more intelligent than me might have a good answer. <laughs> Yeah, my question is to Poonam. So you showed that when you change the electric field, there is a broadening of the absorption spectra. So why is that? So, so actually, um, so this is actually called the Stark effect, uh, which is very widely studied. And in the case of Stark effect, the uh, so the broadening is actually because you have these molecules which are aligned either parallel or anti parallel or like in different orientations. And because in molecular systems the orientations are random, in this case, when the dipole moments are randomly oriented, it actually leads to a broadening in the spectrum. And then let's thank our young scientists again. <laughs>
And uh, for challenges and opportunities, of course, that like uh, especially challenges that many sciences are facing. So we talked about like step from the lab to the market industry, of course, like and by giving fragility of quantum systems. And there's also some resources which we talked about, like funding system to support uh, youth or like breakthrough science and average uh, creativity of the young people. So this way, like some seniors can help other youth scientists to break through like uh, the challenges and uh, give them more opportunities. Okay, so are there questions, comments, agreement, disagreement? You can also add something maybe that we discussed and that you think maybe should need some Maybe I ask a question, you had this funding point at the end. I mean, to, to my impression, there is tons of funding for, for quantum physics and technology, but what do you mean by this point? Like uh, for uh, for the funding, like from my like point that, that I was discussing with my group is that like, uh, uh, Sometimes, like theoretical scientists, don't find fundings because, like, they are theoretical, and a lot of people are afraid maybe from funding theoretical science. But maybe that's not like this is maybe just like in a small zone. Maybe if we get open into a different zone, maybe as uh, uh, one of our colleagues said, like maybe if you go to Japan or others, maybe they can offer you to like opportunities and yeah, and help you grow go through these challenges. I see. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know that I have a clear idea, one, one of the associated with the funding. Uh, my point was, uh, we have a funding system in the world that supports science in a very review-driven fashion. And of course, there's a lot of important, I mean, relevance to this and importance to this for a particular type of science. Uh, the, one of the points we were trying to make is that maybe some of the breakthrough science, it's uh, not quite easy to write a proposal for. Uh, Peter Gruss, uh, the president of the ex-president of the Max Planck Society and the president of OIST, had once given a talk where he said it, uh, it wasn't quite easy, it's not easy to write a proposal for, say, penicillin, where you write that tomorrow I'm going to accidentally knock this medicine into this jar and it's going to kill the bacteria. So sometimes for breakthrough science, you might need a new funding model uh, that that true that that is not uh, encumbered by our review system and proposal writing system. I don't have a solution necessarily, so I, I feel stupid saying something that I don't have an answer for. Uh, m maybe the Max Planck directorships are are a form of that. Uh, but if you want to do truly exploratory creative science, that a feel like quantum excitation and information likely needs, where you don't know the applications that are gonna mm -hmm. come in the future. You may need, the governments of our world may need to develop funding strategies that are not specifically review-driven, uh, proposal-driven strategies. I think that was a broader I point see. that I was trying mm -hmm. to make. Okay, any other comments on this topical area? Just very briefly, I mean, uh, the quantum information has its own challenges, of course, they are maybe uh, not addressed here so much, but there's a, a plenary roundtable discussion this afternoon on the applications of, of quantum computers, and I can just recommend this, uh, where you will learn from experts on, the, on this panel what the state of the art is there and uh, what we can or cannot expect. Okay. Thanks. Good. Uh, as I said, maybe in the end, when all presentations were there, we still, I think we have time, I think, maybe to discuss some questions and so on. So thank you very much for the speakers, uh, for the presenters, yeah, and speakers. So, and thank you. So my name is Ferrai Unlö. I'm from Helmholtz Centrum Berlin. And yeah, we talked about light and imaging, but we had two experts, like one from light and one from um, non-optical imaging, so atomic force uh, micros. Um, microscopy. So for um, the light um, part, 
The main breakthroughs were the super resolution microscopy, which is Im uh, important for structural biology, and the single cell optoelectronics, which um, Professor um, Emiliani sh um, showed today. And this is um, important, or the impact is for understanding the uh, brain function in real time and in vivo with um, certain cell types, within certain cell types. And also um, the um, other big impact is a visual um, restoration. In uh, imaging, um, atomic resolution imaging is something which is already, I mean, happened um, in the past, but the new breakthrough is the combination of atomic resolution imaging with electron spin resonance and also the combination of um, um, atomic resolution imaging with ultra short light pulses, which um, allows a high time resolution. And the goal is, I mean, it's not reached yet, but the goal is to um, image breaking and making bonds during catalysis or other chemical reactions, which will, of course, um, allow the fundamental understanding, but also to allow to make chemistry more sustainable. And the challenges um, for the um, optogenetics is the application to humans, so the light delivery to humans, as uh, Professor Emiliani showed, okay, um, it was possible to open the brain of ma mouse and then to look inside. This will be not uh, easy for humans, um, of course. And the risk or potential risks of photo damage has to be also um, considered and uh, the in vivo super resolution. And in, um, in imaging side, uh, there was a limit. Um, the limitation was okay. It's not applicable yet for living organisms because there is also um, the limits of doing this in ambient conditions. And yeah, the resources actually we had a common uh, point here. So to find uh, in so interdisciplinary um, uh, training or institution, let's say, okay, to find a consortium where everyone everyone un understands each other because it's I mean the fields are very multidisciplinary. So biologists work with physicists and uh, chemists and engineers all working together. So um, there should be. Uh, more like options for interdisciplinary um, fi financing programs, institutions, and training. So this was the main resource that this needed. Questions, comments, or something to add? I can start with a very specific one uh, so that came into my mind. We discussed a little bit. Also, the uh, if you write a proposal, there are also these additional boundaries so how to treat how do you treat your data but also these ethical issues and so my question since that came into my mind when I saw uh, the research on on these living organisms so how do you see that is this a limitation so I, I would have doubts that maybe some of this research could be done in any place uh, because of ethical regions uh, reasons um, how does the future look like I think are there ways maybe to reduce the amount of this kind of research that has to be done with living animals will it always be the case like this and uh, how much is the pressure I think not to, not to do this <clears throat> research. Maybe you can comment on this a little bit. So give a give a vision of this thing. How how does this develop, or would this pose a limitation to the research? I guess Professor Mariani. <laughs> so this is definitely part of when we were saying that one of the challenges of doing this kind of research is to have interdisciplinary institution because. Uh, it's true that the field now is really, I wouldn't say even, even more than interdisciplinary, it's really multidisciplinary. And if you really want to advance in the field, you need to have a, a state-of-the-art photonics together with the possibility to, to perform real experiment in, in living animals. And this today is, is highly regulated, and you really need to be in an institution which has a, an approved animal facility with the people that know how to to, to to prepare and the protocol and how to treat the animals and also it, this is really the challenge of the story to uh, to to try to bring to bring to bring physics laboratory within this kind of institution and then about your question is is there another way so for sure there is a, a big uh, regulation in the field so to reduce as much um, as much as possible the use of animals uh, animals can be not only mice can also be zebra fish can also be worms so there are also other organisms and uh, in in some 
field, people are trying to replace animal experimentation with organoids. This is not always the right the, 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 the solution. I mean, not everything can be done because you, you lose the function, you use the functionality, but there are things that connectonics, there, there are things that can, can be replaced. So I think that still uh, uh, animal experimentation is important. And uh, it's also important that it's well regulated, of course. But I don't think that if you really want to, at least I, I speak in, my, in the field of neuroscience, if you really want to enter more and more in understanding how the brain works, we, we cannot really avoid to go through this phase of, of, of experiments. Thank you. More question? It maybe brings me to, to another point, maybe that you had discussed also. So um, how we discussed briefly how to, when we talked about what is an impact and uh, what is a challenge. So what is the justification of spending and uh, other people who are far away from science, they say wasting all this money on research. So I think aside from ethical issues, you even more have to explain why this is important. But uh, also in science in a general, maybe all scientists live in some kind of bubble, so we, we understand why science is important. But there's a large fraction, the population, and uh, they wouldn't understand why you have to spend money on something well uh, that has no immediate use. Maybe some some comments maybe from, from this field in this direction, I don't know. So I come from the field where we do fundamental research and often it's not directed and this ties in I think a little bit with the comment you had about funding before. Often you don't know where this will end. So we look at very fundamental basic processes and we try to improve the tools like get this atomic resolution even better and better. And at the beginning we don't really know what this is good for but then at the one thing is we increase our fundamental understanding not aimed yet where this is applicable, but then often applications come up that are important. And one example that I showed today was to look at the formation of soot and to find this pathway and get then a cleaner combustion. And we never had this in mind when we started like improving the resolution of our microscopes. But then once you have better tools and you can learn more, then you see things where you can apply it and that might actually even help society. So I, I, I think it's a strong statement for fundamental science and yeah you cannot have this plan i do this now i just do this now and in 10 years i solve this problem it's often you just try to increase our fundamental understanding how well we see things how can we resolve things what we do understand and um, this is needed to make progress and also breakthroughs that are important for society thank you yeah, I 100% I agree with you and I would like to to support this statement because it's true that there, there is a very large community of, let's say, tool makers that can be a probe, a fluorescent probe, can be optical microscope, can be new uh, imaging approach. And uh, in, in some cases, very it's, it's becoming more and more difficult, especially if we build up microscope for biology. It's becoming more and more difficult to get financed because if you don't have the question, okay, okay, but which is the question you want to answer? And I perfectly agree with you that in most of the case, you cannot know the question until you don't know what your tool can do. And until the people don't learn about the tool, they, they cannot even know that there are questions that you can solve. So is, uh, this is in, in our very short sentence about financing program that is, is I absolutely agree. Uh, sometimes we are really, really too much driven towards a certain application, medical, even medical application now, when uh, you might be very, very far away from medical application, but still develop a tool that in 10, 20 years can be of major importance. Thank you very much. All the speakers. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so, I, uh, my name is uh, Bob Rosner. I'm from the University of Chicago, and um, I'm very pleased to be here, I must say. Uh, so I was dragooned at the very end to be the speaker. Um, uh, so uh, I found the, uh, our session actually particularly interesting because uh, the, the question of, of energy supply, where we're going, is at the heart of almost everything we're doing here. And um, 
what is particularly interesting is the topics that were discussed, but also the topics that were not discussed and where we didn't have representatives. So I, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about that. So, so the, fir the first question is, of course, the reality of moving uh, away from fossil-based energy sources and how, how one does that. And uh, one can do that in a number of ways. Some of them, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, fission-based nuclear power has been around for a very long time. It started actually at my university. Um, and as I, I think everybody in the room knows, it's a technology that has been open to a lot of criticism, social criticism, uh, all sorts of criticism, also just plain fear of things nuclear. Uh, and so it's challenged, to say the least, not in all, all countries, but certainly uh, here in Europe and also in North America, I think that's true. And then the reality of, uh, of alternate uh, sources. So some of them, uh, like uh, wind and solar, renewable, uh, but they're not dispatchable. Uh, then there are base power uh, sources. Uh, Thomas, uh, our leader, was uh, g gave a very nice presentation here in, in front, but he actually did a really good job, I thought, over there in the corner, because he, he actually did, went into detail explaining of what the real advances were in fusion. He didn't talk about it here, but he did talk about it. We, got, we twisted his arm a little bit. Uh, and, he, and it was clear, uh, there was a message, I think, that he sent, uh, which is, I think, generally true, which is that if you, if you have the intent to conquer a problem, uh, we are capable of doing it. Uh, the problem that, that uh, he addressed, which is to take uh, accelerated technology, which was, which was first actually thought about at Princeton, uh, in the early 1950s, I think, so it started. Uh, now there's a working stellarator in Gauging. No, no, Ga well, some people in Gauging, but some people in Greifswald. It's located in, in Greifswald. And so that's an amazing achievement. And if you think about how it was done, uh, it involved a, a complex uh, of, of advances. First of all, in just basic physics, understanding uh, exactly how to properly be able to track the particles to get the particle orbits right to, to avoid lo wall losses, for example. It involved uh, technological solutions to the metrology problem because you had to wind these coils in an absolutely perfect way. And at the beginning, it was impossible to really wind them correctly. In fact, I, I, I had the displeasure of having to deal with, I was an advisor committee uh, for the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab at the time when they we're told by the Department of Energy, your, pro your accelerator project is canceled for exactly this reason. It was so difficult to do. So, so uh, my hat's off is to, to, to the chief. It was re really quite an achievement, I must say. Um, uh, so, there's a, so I think there's a kind of a spirit here of what I would call techno-optimism, which is if you just have the, I have to say it in German, it's, it's flash, the willingness to, to keep going on doing something that's really hard, that's, you will succeed. And I, and I think that's, that's a real theme here. Um, now, when you think about uh, energy in general, the, the energy of the future, you have, we know that we've had an amazing revolution on the photo, photovoltaic side. We heard some of that today. In fact, we also heard about what the future is, bring, is bringing. It's gonna bring another 10% in efficiency. So uh, the, what's clear is that uh, technology and um, industrial capacity has made a huge impact in bringing down uh, the cost of photovoltaic produced electricity to an amazing extent. I mean, it's really stunning. And I, you know, if I think back 20 years ago, no one predicted how cheap it was gonna be to produce electricity that way. It's really amazing, but it is not dispatchable. So the question that you have is if you think of, about uh, a, a, a national or a European, you know, continent-wide uh, electricity grid, how are you going to construct it? If it's just based on renewables, what you know is you will need some other way of dealing with the intermittency of, of the renewables, which means storage. So that's a part that we didn't talk about here. Uh, there is a real need in a revolution in storage technologies, battery technologies. Uh, it may be that it's going to be flow, certain kinds of flow, flow uh, chemistry technologies that will do that, but we don't know yet. The alternative is um, base power, 
uh, of the kind, for example, it's offered by uh, fission and fusion nuclear power plants. They're, they're also uh, green in the sense they don't emit uh, uh, carbon dioxide. Some people, I, I, I'm expecting boos from the audience here when I say this, uh, there are some people who claim that natural gas with carbon capture and sequestration is also green. I personally have my doubts about that, but there are people that make that argument. Okay. So that's all from the future. Um, what's clear is that uh, unlike, the, I think, the other uh, uh, talks that we've heard, in this area, the question of social acceptance is really a key to what is going to happen. Uh, the, you know, what, will, what is a society going to accept, willing to do? And to some extent, that depends on uh, how a given a, a so social environment has reacted to climate change and the impact it's already had, or the impact that it fears. And that can change people's minds about things, even, even uh, you know, f uh, fission-based nuclear power. So that's a question out there, and it's a perfect example of, uh, of, I think, what happens at this meeting, which is, I don't know how many sociologists or political scientists we have in this room. I suspect we don't. But those people are the ones that we need in get, get, getting further in this discussion. It's going to be absolutely important. Uh, and then the fi final thing I want to mention is that we had uh, a very good question from an early career scientist who asked, a very telling question, which was, okay, so we have, we have uh, graduate students, we have plenty of positions for graduate students, uh, postdocs are, are not so hard to get, but what about life after postdocs? That, is, can, that can be a challenge. And the question is, how is that in Germany? How is that in other European countries? How is it in North America? My, my own sense is that in the States, it's probably a bit easier than here. And so that's, an, that's a question to you, but how do you resolve that problem? Thank you. Thanks a lot for this detailed summary. Are there questions? I have a question regarding fusion. I mean, more or less triggered by the progress in the big fusion experiment, there is now a whole scene of startups, both laser-based fusion and others. I mean, how serious should we take this? I mean, we, Thomas has shown us big machines which are, have been optimized in a sense over decades. Uh, your machine, Wendelstein, also ITER is on this way. So. And on the other hand, you have these small frame um, activities. I'm, I'm a laser guy myself, and so people always want to build a bigger laser, yeah? but this does not necessarily mean that this laser brings you closer to laser fusion. So, so I mean, what, what is the, the, the impression there? Yeah. So, so, so I'll give a very biased opinion, okay? Uh, so I, 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 I have to, it's important to, to, to explain what my connection is to this field, okay? So, um, so I, 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 I do plasma physics, plasma astrophysics, and I've also been on the advisory committee, science advisory committees for both uh, Princeton and uh, for uh, Lawrence Livermore, for NIF, actually, okay? So uh, I'll, I'll give you my personal opinion, okay? Which is that I think laser fusion is so unlikely as an energy source that, I mean, I, I just don't see it. And just to explain why I say that, uh, the NIF laser, it's actually 192 lasers, um, operate at full power uh, about once a day. The capsule that you hit uh, costs about $100,000 to produce. Okay? And uh, you have to keep in, keep in mind that in terms of the, uh, the uh, you know, return on investment of energy, let's put it that way, okay? You're off by a very large number. Uh, it's, you know, close to a thousand. So, um, uh, so folks have tried to design a, uh, uh, you know, what, what such a energy producing system would look like. It would have to fire at a rate of about 10 hertz. Um, so you go from once a day to 10 hertz, okay? That, that's one issue. Uh, you, you need a change in the energetics by a factor of about 1,000. <clears throat> uh, and uh, 
it has to be repeatable. You remember you're shooting, you know, at 10 hertz, each one is a capsule. If they cost $100,000 each, you're not going to make any money. Right? So, so I think, so, you know, to be, to be frank, uh, the living room people don't talk about it. If you ask them, they do not talk about it as an energy system. They don't. And, and that system was never designed to be an energy system or even an energy research system, okay? Uh, on the, on the, I mean, Thomas should really speak about the, uh, uh, the magnetic fusion. I, I, I am actually optimistic. I think it, w I think it will happen. I think uh, the challenges are nowhere as great. They're, they're big, but they're nowhere as great as in the laser fusion case. And the only question ultimately is going to be, uh, as in many of these things, money, the cost. And uh, you know, if you look at the cost of ITER and the cost evolution of ITER as it was being built, uh, you can't be all that optimistic. Right? So that's, that's a challenge. I think you guys did much better. The stellar rate had, had a, be a better luck. Yeah, of course, one can talk for ages about that, but uh, but I, I try to be brief. Um, so the, these, this private sector development is surprising, indeed. It was also a surprise to us. So five years ago, I would would call you as uh, crazy if you would would reckon that, uh, that it would happen. Um, but it is a very interesting development because there is uh, all of a sudden there is capital around, investment capital, not only risk capital but also altruistic capital. It, because we, we, we all see that the, the, the earth is in flames and, uh, and there are some very wealthy people who want to do something. It, and so this is uh, for a certain one element why additional capital became available. Um, and this has created a kind of Cambrian explosion in, <laughs> in, in fusion activities. Not all of them will survive, I guess. It, so there will be an evolutionary effect in, in, in that. Um, um, but, uh, but it will clearly bring the whole business forward because in the private sector you have more degrees of freedom, you can take more risk. And that's the biggest difference because we all public service guys, we are, uh, we are uh, working with taxpayers' money and taxpayers' money is extreme, must be extremely risk adverse. So we cannot take any risk, it's just forbidden by law. Uh, and uh, the private sector is different of course, they, they can play around with uh, even with risky technologies and can be a bit more prudent in the progress. I think that's, that's a plus. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I really liked your point about, uh, if I remember correctly, about including uh, social science and um, to figure, I think, I would put it into the context of figuring out what is what is and isn't acceptable to uh, the public. And I think, so my impression is, um, or when I read articles about these things, is that the, the public is much more receptive to change than we usually think. And then the question is, why aren't we changing? Because all of these things that the world is on fire, we basically know, have known for 30 years, right? And nothing has changed. And I think my impression is that we are underestimating the contrast um, power of like fossil fuel c companies, for example. And so I really like the idea of, of, of taking social science and, and, and seeing how we can actually now change the narrative and, and really go in a good direction. And so just as a note, uh, we're all in the physical science field here, right? So in, in these sort of forums, it would be really good to have some cross crosstalk. I totally agree, as you know. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Thank you. So I have a comment on the last question that you raised, what, what is after postdoc, right. Right? right? So I was a postdoc until last December, so I moved from academia to other job. So I think uh, the institutions and the universities they should organize more career symposiums for the postdocs or PhD students, what to do. And also kind of training is required, so like how to prepare a CV, right? For example, when I was applying to industry, my CV was academic CVs. It was like 11 or 13 page long, so they don't care about that CV, right? 
So that kind of training is required, and I think it would be quite useful for the early career researchers, postdocs, if uh, the institutes or the universities, they organize more often these career things. Thank you. OK, important topic, yes. Can I, can I raise a question about that? So, so one thing that, that's, um, that in the past was an issue in the, in the States was that if you were on an academic track and then you stepped out of it and you went to industry, that the chances of you going back were basically zero. That basically it was a one-way street. And over, I would say over the last 10 years, that's changed dramatically. There, it's actually very common for people to spend some time in industry, then go come back to university and, uh, and you know, end up being faculty. So we, in Chicago, we just basically started a new area uh, of research. That's basically virtually all the people came f back from industry. And I'm just wondering what it's like in Germany about this very issue. To what extent is it a one-way street to go industry? Or not. I cannot comment on that. So well, I'm well, sure I the people in this audience no, know I, the I can to comment this. on it. I mean, it's in physics. It's also slowly improving. I mean, there is a long tradition in this in engineering. Uh, so engineering faculty t frequently hire people who have worked in industry for 20 years because th they are experts for particular topics. In 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 the basic sciences, it's not so popular yet, but. Um, it's, I, to my impression, it increases. I mean, a second issue is when you go from academia to industry, which has been a big issue in the past, is the age of the yes. person. Uh, so so when, when I was a grad student, we were told, look, if you want to, to go to industry, you better get your PhD at 27, 28, and, and, and when you are 30, forget about it. Uh, this has totally changed. Uh, and this has to do also with the lack of people who are available in total. Uh, and, and then on the next level of career in Germany, we still have this degree of habilitation, uh, which is more or less a pre-qualifier for becoming professor. And these people stay longer at universities. And in the old days, many of them were, were beyond 40, and they had at that time you know, a substantial fraction of them had really difficulties if they couldn't make it to a professorship to survive. Uh, this also changed a lot, and and so I'm not aware that this is still a big problem. So in this sense, the system becomes more flexible, but still the interface from industry to academia, to my impression, is not transparent enough yet. Uh, Okay, so thanks again, and I don't see it. So the next point is, is wrap up, and actually, Oliver, do you want to wrap up? <laughs> so uh, we agreed that there maybe wouldn't be so much to wrap up. We had a nice discussion, I think, already about, uh, uh, I think, our topics now. And uh, so maybe my was last recommendation would also be to the younger researchers, maybe because everybody, uh, before everybody runs away, maybe if you need maybe to talk to somebody, please maybe exchange contact details. So. In former times, we exchanged some cards. I don't know, now you maybe exchange your QR codes or whatever. But maybe it's a good chance. I think maybe pick somebody and don't be shy and maybe uh, just maybe exchange your contact details so that you can uh, stay in touch. But aside from this, uh, so I uh, enjoyed uh, this meeting very much. And uh, so, uh, as Thomas said, this can be continued during this meeting. And so thank you to everyone uh, who uh, participated here. So the speakers in particular, but also everyone who uh, discussed, I think, in the corners and uh, just uh, was a very uh, active audience here and I enjoyed it and I hope you do and I wish you uh, a nice uh, afternoon and a uh, nice rest of the week maybe at this conference. Thanks. Mm -hmm.